Get a Book. Today presents the Praetorian Imperative, Book Six in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2019. It had long been said that human beings had reached a level of such comfort, the only thing that could snap them out of their unconcerned haze would be an enemy soldier yanking the remote out of their hand and shooting their television. For career military officers like Admiral Benjamin Powers, this state of affairs was even more urgent. Politicians and professional meeting attenders were not only highly motivated to perpetuate comfort bubbles for their constituents, they were also likely to be heavily engaged in the business of dishonoring the men and women tasked with preserving civilian lives. One simply couldn't have truth-tellers wearing impressive uniforms and standing in front of television cameras. Those were situations that called for delicate, or indelicate as the case may be, discretion, or outright lying, which was apparently a far easier option for the average guest of honor at a press conference. At the moment, the biggest challenge to getting through the day for the admiral and key members of his staff was going to be getting into the building. The Corps Council Hall was quite literally surrounded by protesters, press, crowds of onlookers, civilian police, aliens from a dozen worlds or more, hovering look-down cameras, and at least several hundred automatic barricade robots deployed to politely keep 100 tons of body weight from smashing through the front doors and streaming into the corridors of power. It had been at least a week since Corps Alliance President William Baines had uttered the word recusal in a live address. It was a political slip-up, to be sure but it wasn't the hair-on-fire cataclysm the media had inflated around it. Skywatch Command and the agencies in charge of civilian military oversight had done everything in their power to keep Shay Baines out of the news. But the rumors of her abduction and the wildly inaccurate accounts of what had come to be known as the failed attempt to rescue her seeped into the public consciousness in ways that were almost as insidious as enemy spies. No official word had been offered regarding the events that either had or had not taken place on Mycenae Seti IV. The only Skywatch officers authorized to even know about Commander and Nora Doverly's mission were unwilling to answer questions, even those posed by administration chiefs with the power to declassify just about anything. The truth was, no usable transmissions had been received from the M-Seti system. Officially, Doverly and Moody were listed as overdue. Unofficially and for all practical intents and purposes, they were missing in action behind enemy lines. Jason Hunter had been ordered to account for himself, his ship, and his actions in the Rho Theta and Atlantis systems by a civilian committee headed by one of President Baines's most bitter political enemies. Within minutes, the captain had been given a direct order by Admiral Powers himself to remain silent. That standoff led directly to the hearing that was about to take place on the floor of the Corps Council. The judge advocate general himself had threatened to intervene, but Powers had talked him down. Admiral Bartholomew James had threatened to discredit Powers publicly, but he had been driven back by Commander Skywatch's chief of staff, who implied in a press conference the highest-ranking military officer in the Corps Alliance was considering official action to, as the press office put it, moderate any professional disagreements in a manner consistent with the highest traditions of Skywatch. Nobody knew for sure what the hell that meant but it was pretty clear to the Admiralty that any further posturing, especially in public, was unlikely to be tolerated. If there was one thing a man described as the highest-ranking military officer in the Corps Alliance could do, it was threaten subordinates with unimaginable wrath while sounding like he was reading the menu in a cozy Italian lunch spot. The morning air along the banks of the pond was something that had to be experienced to be believed. It made men think of simpler times and how thrilling it would be to make trips back and forth to town for things like feed and oil for the lamp. For some, that was paradise considered to more urgent concerns like enemies with reality-altering weapons and the safety of space fleets and their crews. Leaves crunched underfoot. The sky was blue enough to make a romantic's heart break. Only a few clouds were visible along the horizon. It was going to be a beautiful day, and tomorrow was likely to be even better. It was more than a little frightening how quickly one imagined they could acclimate to such an idyllic place. It was disconcerting how rapidly one might become unconcerned with war and strife billions of miles away, despite the call of duty and the certitude of courage. Sitting along the banks of the river were three young boys. By the looks of them, they were almost as bored as the ducks a few yards from shore. One plunked small rocks into the water in a meager attempt to annoy the web-footed fowl, while the others sat with their chins resting in their hands. 
Next to them was an instantly recognizable model aircraft. It was a wooden replica of an early 20th century fighter. It was even decorated with the Prussian Iron Cross. Not going to be much of a fishing trip with no poles or bait. The boys all looked up as if startled out of plans to knock over a grocery store. Fishing is boring, one of them said, making a point of letting his chin fall right back into his hands. Did you paint that plane yourself? I made it from a kit, the fair-haired boy said. It came with stickers for all the parts, but it won't fly right. Stupid kit makers said it would, but it's broken and the radio doesn't even work. The expressions on their faces didn't change. Jason Hunter knelt by the model and picked it up. Its wingspan was roughly two feet. It felt light enough for its size. He turned the model over. The fixed landing gear were solidly attached. The wheels even turned. By now all the boys were watching, curious to see if the man knew why their plane couldn't get off the ground. One thing Jason noticed that was strange was the fact the underside of the plane's wings seemed to be sanded off to a flat finish. He looked more closely and saw the seams in the material at the wing's edges. The model was constructed out of a sturdy but light composite with a texture similar to balsa wood, but smoother and coated with a sealant under the colorful paint. She's a D-type albatross, Jason said as he spun the propeller. The boys looked at him as if he had just announced he was a giraffe. Beautiful aircraft, formidable in her time. How do you know what kind of plane it is? Ancient fighter aircraft are a hobby of mine. I used to have a model of this ship's twin in my dorm at the academy. This is one of the planes flown by the Red Baron. By now, Hunter had the undivided attention of the little model plane's ground crew. Red Baron? You've never heard the story? Hunter asked. All three shook their heads. Manfred von Richthofen, one of the deadliest men ever to take flight. He shot down more than 80 enemy pilots. He flew the Fokker DR-1 triplane and this one too. He was a German pilot long ago in a conflict called World War I. The boys all had astonished expressions. It was as if they had never heard the story of a war before, or of a man who had fought in one. It made sense. Epsilon Gamma was several light years from any system any civilized star-faring civilization would consider worth fighting over. The term backwater was likely to appear in any description of the two habitable planets orbiting the unremarkable yellow star at its center. Any army that won Epsilon Gamma was as likely to give it back as anything else. Did you know him? One of the boys asked. I've read about him, Hunter replied. He lived a long time before I was born, but everyone still knows his name. His was the legend of the Red Baron. His Fokker triplane was painted all red with black crosses on the wings and tail. If you were a British or a French pilot and you saw that unmistakable red flash in the sky, you knew you were in for the fight of a lifetime. By now their mouths were hanging open. One might have credibly thought they were hypnotized. Does the engine run? Jason asked. The fair-haired boy nodded. Well, then let's see what seems to be the problem. Jason stood, holding the model. Where's a good wide flat surface we can use for a runway? The rocks and ducks were forgotten. The three boys were now totally focused on reclaiming air superiority over the pond. They ran to the nearby road, which was the site of their last failed attempt to get airborne. The fair-haired boy retrieved the radio control unit for the plane. Jason quickly determined both units were battery-powered. As with most toys, the electronics were dramatically limited. He knelt by the side of the road and broke out his universal. In moments, the circuit boards of both controller and plane had been exposed. See this? Jason indicated an orange connection controller on the radio. This is a signal dampener. It keeps your controller from fouling up the village communications net. But since we're two miles from town, and since you're going to promise me you won't fly this aircraft any closer to town, we're going to disable it for now. That will give you an extra couple hundred yards of range and save you some battery power while we're at it. The boys crowded around as if they were watching tiny dinosaurs battle in a model arena. This is the digital signal processor, and this is the power supply. Everything looks like it's connected properly. Just one problem to fix. See this? Jason indicated the underside of the plane's wings. This is packing material. He snapped the two foam pieces loose, revealing a curved surface that was no longer hidden by the foam. For an aircraft to fly, it needs lift. That means the air passing over the wing has to move faster than the air passing under it. That pulls the plane up into the sky. If there's something under the wing, that creates drag, and the plane doesn't get any lift. That's why it wouldn't fly before. 
Jason held the aircraft level. See the shape? How the upper surface of the wing is curved and the lower surface is flatter? By the looks on their faces, one could have credibly concluded Jason Hunter had just awarded them one of the keys to the universe. The captain could see the gears turning in three young heads. He knew they wouldn't be able to wait long to see their plane in action, so he reassembled the circuit board covers for both units, made sure they had power, and set the albatross down on the dusty road. It looked rather frail just sitting there by itself, but the captain knew it wouldn't be still for long. He handed the radio to the fair-haired boy. The other two looked like they were about to take flight themselves. Their gazes snapped back and forth from plane to radio as they performed their final flight checks. The fair-haired boy looked up at Jason, his expression somewhere between asking permission and gratitude. Jason nodded. Contact! He barked. The boy smiled. The radio controller lit up as the tiny throttle spun the plane's propeller up to speed. It started rolling down the road with the other two boys running along either side. For a moment, it appeared the little model was going to rattle itself to pieces, bumping and banging into rocks, pieces of wood and other debris. Finally, it hopped a good six feet before bouncing off the road and taking flight. The two boys chasing it stopped and threw their hands up, cheering as the albatross D-type soared into the sky. Even the joy at Kitty Hawk would have paled in comparison. Let's have a slow circle of the battlefield, pilot, Jason said, mostly for show. He folded his arms in his best officer inspection pose. The fair-haired boy guided the controls and his plane rolled left. It began a leisurely course arc back towards its makeshift runway with its tiny engine buzzing and wheezing. Jason and the boy turned to watch as it flew overhead and banked left again, flying out over the nearby riverbank and two cows who couldn't have cared less. Hunter put his hand up over his eyes to keep sight of the craft as it flew past its first course again. You are cleared to land. The boy expertly guided the tiny plane down towards the same road, this time in the opposite direction. The other boys ran as it flew by and finally touched down. In a few yards it rolled to a stop. The fair-haired boy ran ahead. Jason chose to stroll. The energy level in the amateur flight crew was a rather stark contrast to their demeanor fifteen minutes earlier. In the distance, Jason could see a woman making her way through the tall grass. Further in the distance was a homestead of some kind. A fence separated a yard from the rest of the trees around the pond. The faint outline of eaves and a house were visible beyond the leaves and branches. Nick! Nick! Come in for breakfast now! The tone in her voice was unmistakably a mom's. Her apron and dish towel completed the image. She didn't linger for an answer. The message had been delivered and the morning's aerial adventures would have to be postponed. Nick! who Jason surmised was the fair-haired leader of the Epsilon Gamma Historical Aircraft Society, ran up to the captain and held a hand over his eyes to shield them from the morning glare. Come to breakfast at my house. You have to meet my uncle and tell him about the Red Heron. Jason had to admit he was more than a little hungry, and it had been a considerable interval since he had been served a home-cooked breakfast on a planet's surface. That sounds great. He guided the boy by the shoulder and walked along with his new adopted students towards the fence and gate. The captain had to admit, he also couldn't wait to hear the story of the Red Heron. He also had to admit he was of two minds on this particular morning. One was headed to breakfast, the other was a great distance away, in a torn and bleeding star system called Bayoni, where his fellow officers and crewmates had fought for the lives of thousands of civilians and to preserve their ability to protect the core alliance from a man whose motives were still as obscure and dangerous as ever. The captain of the starship Argent, and the flag of a powerful military force called Strike Fleet Perseus, had performed a daring vanishing act. As a student of war, Jason Hunter was well aware all military strategies ultimately depended on deception in some form. In this particular case, they also depended on misdirection. He had always known this particular gambit would require him to be patient and leave the details to the highly trained officers he had so often relied on for life and limb. That didn't make it any easier. He had to avoid the battlefield as urgently as he wanted to reclaim it. The future success of the starship Argent depended on Captain Hunter executing a plan that was sure to have traumatized half his crew and endangered the other half. It was a gamble. The kind of thing Hunter specialized in. It was what he had built an entire career out of. Battleship captains were rarely risk-takers. 
and they most certainly weren't brash hair-on-fire warriors with larger-than-life images and the obligations they demanded. Capital ships were simply too expensive and too valuable to use as spear points. An officer assigned to command a ship like Argent was traditionally a heavily armed mayor as opposed to an army's high champion. Line captains didn't roar into the breach, and they certainly didn't lead from the front. Hunter broke all those rules, and then some. The admirals who had put him in the center chair aboard the fleet's newest strike battleship were well aware of his propensity for what some rivals referred to as expletive heroics. They wanted that brand of fighting to go with the brand of hardware Argent brought to the party. The prudent faction at Skywatch Command had risked everything to overcome anti-alarmist obstructionism. There was no sense in being meek about betting heavily on the outcome. Jason Hunter was that bet. He was also the only captain who would even dream of what he was attempting. At the same time, he was the only captain likely to pull it off. If he succeeded, he would have a gargantuan tactical advantage at the time of his choosing. If he failed, irradiated planets and billions of casualties would become an eternal monument to a man who was too clever by half. But this gambit wasn't a simple act of misdirection. Hunter was also gambling on the personalities of his fellow pilots. The Bandit Jacks were an example of the rare moment when five superstars joined forces and somehow managed to synthesize their egos and hunger for the spotlight. Some compared them to great sports teams of the past. In football, for example, they often used the example of a future Hall of Fame quarterback teaming up with a future Hall of Fame receiver. Neither player could achieve his goal without the other, so they were forced, in a manner of speaking, to cooperate, bury their attitudes, and become part of something bigger than either one of them. That was what many surmised had happened to the Jacks. Hunter rocketed through his promotions. He was one of only about 4% of the members of each academy class that graduated to a commission as a junior grade lieutenant instead of an ensign. In Hunter's case, his graduation included an invitation to flight school, largely because of his aptitude for the math and his reputation as a leader among his classmates. The promotion was his scholarship, and he proved in rapid fashion it was well deserved. In less than a year, he was on the short list for lieutenant, and six months after that, he was on an even shorter list for a command rank. Commander Doverly was right behind him with every step. Her early graduation from the academy at age 19 earned her a degree in aerospace medicine, which she parlayed into the space military equivalent of an MD 18 months later. She applied to flight school, set records in some of the entrance tests, and lost a bid to replace Jason Hunter as a student squadron leader by half a decimal point. When he turned around and recruited her for his squadron, instead of letting her lead a different team, it sent shockwaves through the entire class. Doverly accepted and became the number two pilot in what would eventually come to be known as the greatest combat squadron in Skywatch history. Of all his fellow officers, Jason knew it would be Anora who would refuse to accept the pat answer. He had observed her relentless nature on so many occasions it was hard to keep them all straight. He was there when she helped a first-time mom overcome 19 hours of labor to deliver twins. He was there when the young Lieutenant Doverly discovered a flaw in the upgraded fuel system of the first-generation Yellowjacket fighters at the Academy Air and Space Show. She earned a commendation from a Vice Admiral for that particular act, since it saved the lives of eight of her fellow pilots. Everyone told her she was wrong. The technicians and engineers tried to tell her to mind her own business, and that doctors didn't belong on the flight line in the first place. But she didn't give up, and Hunter was there to see every moment of it. The night before, she arrived at the receiving line for the officer's ball looking like a monarch's daughter. She wore a glittering off-the-shoulder gown and wore her auburn hair in delicate curls down her back. Her grandmother's silver necklace completed a stunning ensemble. She was the talk of the night, and Jason had the honor of dancing with her not once, but twice. The next morning she was nose-to-nose -nose with a chief petty officer, Atmos in one hand and a wrench in the other. Jason was almost certain he had found the perfect woman on that day, but he was more than certain he had found his combat wing. She was going to be told what everyone thought had happened over Bayonne 3 and what had happened at Omicron. She was going to end up with the exact same information as his sister. They were all in pursuit of the same man. Competent officers were going to explain the chase to Honora in detail. They might even throw in a few pie charts and spreadsheets. And when it was all over, Jason Hunter knew his number two pilot was going to respond with the profane version of nonsense and set out in search for the real answers. When she found them, 
and found the trail of the missing civilian she was pursuing. The captain was going to have all the pieces in place to execute his strategy. He was going to strike at his enemy where they least expected. The entire Perseus officer's corps knew whatever disappeared through the mysterious doorway at Raleo had to be connected to the buildup of hostilities between the Sarn and the Alliance. If there was one thing they had all learned, it was the fact the correlation between Colonel Atwell's misguided discoveries and the decision by no fewer than four alien governments to become belligerent enough to start a war were connected. Finding the connection would undoubtedly be the key to stopping the threat and winning the war. If Hunter had to follow his unidentified enemy through that doorway into the unknown, so be it. It wouldn't be the first time the captain had risked life and limb to protect mankind's planets. His confidence in his wing pilot was his anchor. As it turned out, he only needed a pair of jacks to survive Atlantis. That's why he knew a pair of jacks would be enough to beat Shea Bane's abductors and whatever Okshada and Mu had run into on M. Seti 8. The rest were bills that had to be paid in the future. At the moment, however, someone nearby was cooking a magical combination of green peppers, eggs, and bacon. It was like time shattered. The conference room aboard the starship Psy Key was not quite as luxurious as the three line officers remembered from their time aboard much larger vessels, but it was also sparse and lacked distractions, which was a key advantage for this particular meeting. Jace had been granted leave by Admiral Tucker to pursue a priority target. Before mustering her forces and settling the Raleo situation once and for all, the commander decided to get the inside story directly from the source. Vice Admiral Charles Hughes had recovered to the point where he at least looked like he was part of Skywatch again. He wore the closest approximation of an admiral's uniform the Master Chief could find in the ship's stores. It helped that none of the other officers or crew present aboard the frigate were officially assigned to her. In the short time they had manned her as their more easily managed forward deployed ship, Commander Jace Hunter and the other members of her ad hoc recon unit had made themselves at least temporarily at home. Yili Curtis had engineering in top shape. Zoni Tixia had overhauled the tiny ship's communications equipment, giving her the equivalent of a destroyer's electronic warfare capability, and Hunter herself had helped reorient the weapon systems into something a little more efficient. Psy Ki was no longer underpowered, which was good news because captain and crew were on a mission. Jace Hunter personally believed most of the dangers faced by Strike Fleet Perseus and its various attached units were the result of incomplete information regarding their adversary. So she made a series of briefings with Admiral Hughes, the top priority for herself and the other senior officers, before another moment was invested in tracking down whatever was going on in the Raleo star system. They needed answers, and they needed them soon. There was no way either Hunter was going to tolerate reality-bending question marks while they were trying to keep humanity itself alive. What exactly does that mean, Admiral? Hughes took a breath to speak. Hunter realized she needed to keep things focused and shifted gears. Scratch that. Let's go back to the beginning. Dunkirk is ordered to Gatern. Why? The Admiral sighed. He looked weary, but the other officers and Master Chief Buckmaster knew he wasn't as frail as he had been. Skywatch Command briefed myself and Captain Leary before we departed. Our initial course took us to each of the key waypoints along the Reach. The plan was to make Dunkirk visible to any potential aggressors. So you weren't trying to avoid detection? Hughes nodded. That is correct. Buckmaster leaned back in his chair and tugged at his beard. Hunter persisted. Admiral, why just the Dunkirk? If the purpose was to show the flag as Jason believes, how would a single strike cruiser deter an aggressor? You have good instincts, Commander, Hughes said with a chuckle. I asked the same question before we departed and didn't get much of a coherent response. There were a lot of words, but none of the admirals giving the orders were present when the right questions were asked. Those who were there didn't have much to say. It was all very confusing. The kind of confusing you get when people are trying to cover their tracks, Zoni Tixia said abruptly. Jason said they were after us. Maybe they were after the Admiral, too. It would give them the perfect excuse to order Argent into the region to investigate. Once we get here, we became a target just like Dunkirk. Hughes nodded at Zoni's reasoning. Jay still had her arms folded. I have to admit, Admiral, she has a point. Argent was a target for at least two major attacks, and so were we. Perseus was attacked? Correct. They came after us when we were in formation at Station 19. Ships started appearing out of nowhere during a long-range energy weapons attack. 
Fury was hit hard. We almost lost the constellation. I think whatever they were trying to accomplish at the station got disrupted by us. They took a swipe at Exeter and were driven back. Then they took out after our whole task force. When that didn't work, they sent an even heavier force after my brother. All to protect Barker's asteroid and one sentinel, Yili added. Hughes got up and stood at the display. Psyche's conference had a smaller screen than Argent or Fury, but it was perfectly capable of displaying the Gitarn region, complete with the asteroid field, the positions of Uniform and X-Ray Tango, and Scorpion 1-3. Flypaper, Hughes said quietly. I beg your pardon, sir, Buckmaster said. If I wanted to keep a task force occupied for an indeterminate number of days, how would I go about it? The Admiral asked rhetorically. Keep throwing targets at them, Hunter replied. What does this map look like to you, Commander? Atwell had the ability to teleport matter from one place to the next. He phase-shifted Argent's whole crew into some kind of matter warp, Zoni said. We used his devices to get to the asteroid in the first place. And that, Miss Tixia, is what I mean when I say it was like time shattered. Hughes made his way back to his seat. He had a bit of extra energy, which Jace interpreted as his zeroing in on a plausible theory. Bart James is a powerful man. He also has an incisive mind when it comes to evaluating threats. That's why I couldn't understand his vociferous objections to the buildup. He saw the intelligence. We had the LRS passes over Rho Theta and the telemetry from Repeater 5. We had all the history from Prairie Grove. Our enemies lost a manufacturing empire when we forced them to capitulate at Cloudmark. We knew that would anger all the wrong governments. We persisted and some still believe we have the advantage. Cloudmark was the ceasefire that ended First Praetorian, wasn't it? Yili asked. Buckmaster nodded. One of the most one-sided ends to hostilities in living memory, kind of like a bankrupt business. Three people enter with their wallets, two wallets leave with their owners, and the third guy gets thrown overboard. The third guy in this case being the Sarn Star Empire, Hunter said. Hughes nodded. We won. That didn't mean we had to choke them after the beating. The same officers that are now so confident in our advantage were the ones that helped engineer it. They didn't listen to reason then, and they aren't listening now. They became what most of Skywatch calls the anti-alarmists. They managed to drive career line officers out of the fleet by the dozens. They broke up trained crews. They lobbied to cut funding from long-standing defense initiatives so the money and the power that went with it could be diverted elsewhere. Let's take this to its logical conclusion, Admiral, Hunter said. The anti-alarmists send you and a single strike cruiser to Gitarn for the purposes of deterring our enemies from any aggressive action along the reach. Your ship is waylaid. My brother is sent after you. They try to take Argent out, so he calls in reinforcements and then they try to take me and my task force out. That was the sequence of events if I recall them correctly, Hughes replied. Doesn't that strengthen the case for the alarmists? Hunter asked. A ship sent to protect Gitarn gets attacked? But the Admiral is one of the alarmists. Buckmaster replied. It helps the anti-alarmist if he's not available to champion their cause. This kind of stuff makes me dizzy, Zoni said. If Dunkirk never comes home, they can make up any story they want, Yili added. The Admiral went crazy and fired on friendly ships. Dunkirk collided with an asteroid, Captain Hunter. Buckmaster sat up. Jace snapped her fingers. That's it. She scrambled out of her chair and moved quickly to the map. It all came down to Scorpion 1-3. She slid the controls horizontally and advanced the chronometer in the display until Kingsblade and Argent were on station and engaged with the second Sentinel Planetary Defense Battery. Silverback 755 was detected out of position by Kingsblade. It was a setup. Whoever engineered this engagement expected that ship to become the target. They may as well have had an LED on her hull flashing, Shoot me! They probably planned for Kingsblade to open up first, Yili said. And she did. But Honora was in command and she fired to disable, not destroy. Then Dunkirk is destroyed by one or the other sentinel, Hunter continued. And the anti-alarmists get everything they want. Hughes is out of the way. And Captain Hunter is broken. They could even charge him with manslaughter, Buckmaster concluded. The rising star becomes a fallen man, a perfect anti-poster boy to justify remaking the fleet in their own image. By surrendering the whole Gitarn reach? What does that accomplish? Zoni asked. It keeps Skywatch away from Raleo, Hunter replied, where one Colonel Zachariah Atwell was hard at work trying to turn his dangerous discovery into his very own interstellar empire.
So the story about the chase that ended up there wasn't just a rumor? Zoni asked. Constellation got it all on tape, Yili said. Telemetry, lookdowns, sensor readings, you name it. Commander Flynn got it all. Putting high-energy probes on missiles and firing them at the planet? Genius. The man is a certifiable genius. What happened, Captain? Hughes asked. What you encountered was best described as a psychic echo, Hunter replied. The what now? Yili asked. Mental energy stored inside physical objects, Jace continued. You might even say living souls. That's what invaded your mind. Tried to do the same to my brother. Started shifting objects and people from one dimension to another. Made people think they were hearing and seeing one thing when in reality they were experiencing something else entirely. Who did Constellation chase to Raleo too? Buckmaster asked. We don't know, Hunter replied. It wasn't Atwell. But whoever it was, he had the artifact with him when Flynn lost contact. What artifact? Zoni asked. Whatever allowed him to control the obelisk construct on the planet. Constellation got the only known shots of the thing before she was ordered back to base. Powers buried it all in a vault. Chances are we'll never know. But we do know someone made it to the planet. Someone who isn't Colonel Atwell. And then he wasn't on the planet, Buckmaster said. Correct. He took the artifact through some kind of doorway under the obelisk. Not entirely sure what his objective was, but Constellation found some clues. Flynn told a story about malfunctioning engines to give his surface analysis teams time to gather readings, Hunter replied. He's under orders not to talk about it, but he did tell me a highly entertaining story about hypothetical readings that indicated another time disruption. He traveled through time. Great, Yili said. Well, at least we have all kinds of highly experimental technology to match him now. Whoever this guy is, he has to be in it with Atwell. Just like the anti-alarmists. Buckmaster said with a tone of finality in his voice. I suppose it makes sense. The man was a certifiable dingbat. He'll fit right in with a bunch of admirals who think wiping out two generations of line officers is the way forward. Present company accepted, of course, sir. Hughes nodded. I agree, Master Chief. For all I know, they sent my ship out here as a practice target for their interdimensional weapons. They could have used their mind control against Captain Hunter or anyone in the Perseus task force for that matter. One can only wonder why they didn't. It would have given them all the justification they needed if breaking the captain was their plan. Battle plans have a habit of going to hell, sir, Hunter said. Especially when your opponent does the unexpected. Well, we'd better start coming up with some more dodges and weaves, Buckmaster said. Because if our latest intelligence is accurate, the Sarn's next target is one we absolutely can't afford to lose. Rebecca agrees. I didn't invite her to this meeting. I probably should have reconsidered that decision. But here we are. Commander Islington believes Core 7 is the target of the next attack, Hunter announced. It's far-fetched, but based on what we now know about the motives of the anti-alarmists, it makes a twisted kind of sense, Yili added. If you're going to remake Skywatch in your own image, what better way to do so than to point at its failure to protect an Alliance planet? Or... Let's suppose for a moment you don't want to remake Skywatch. Let's suppose you just want to hand the keys to some superior alien race and turn the core alliance into an insect colony, Hunter replied. If our territory is invaded and civil war breaks out, whomever wants to take over can offer the Ithis and their technology as the means of restoring order. If that's their plan, then we've got a big problem, Buckmaster said. We don't have anywhere near the forces necessary to fight our way past the anti-alarmists and get to Core 7 in time to protect the population. Even if they are working against us, they have rank and a hell of a lot of firepower. And they might have Shea, which compromises our entire government, Zoni added. We're going to have to improvise, Master Chief, Hunter said. They've got a huge head start. If this was their plan all along... They could get to Core 7 and occupy it with one of those teleportation devices, or their mind control like the Admiral says. They could really assault and control a core planet, Zoni said in a faraway voice. Jace Hunter's eyes burned. Not on my watch. Chapter 4 The Viceroy of the Military Affairs Committee was a scrivener of a man by the name of Watson Pete. Powers had considered and rejected at least six different ways to ask subcommittee chairperson Pete why his first name was a last name, but he ultimately decided against provoking another sneer. The man's teeth needed cleaning, and not just a standard pass in a dentist's office, 
but heavy-duty particle beam fire at close range. Pete had long been in the habit of allowing his number two to do all the confronting while he waited for opportunities to deliver the rhetorical coup de grace. The ranking member representing the opposition caucus occasionally went a few rounds with the chairperson. Each of those tangles inevitably concluded with Pete invoking some obscure point of order that prevented further discussion. He celebrated each victory with a prolonged grimace, and then stepped aside so Deputy Chairperson Coda Hull could begin wheezing another series of confusing and frequently pointless questions. Her unique contribution was her steel-gray hair, which was done up in a haphazard beehive that listed at least nine degrees to starboard and contained enough hairspray to blow a bank safe if it were equipped with a fuse. Now then, Mr. Powers, I'd like to return to the events of three weeks ago if you don't mind. It's Admiral Powers, ma'am. Hull looked over her glasses. The glare from the lights could have sterilized a prostitute's pillowcase. I beg your pardon? My rank and title are both Admiral, ma'am. Just like your title, Madam Subcommittee Co-Chairperson. Hull looked back at the rotund, volleyball-shaped little man from the General Counsel's office. He nodded. She made a point of leaning forward in her seat, as if offering a wordless, so what, in protest. Very well, Admiral Powers. Can you explain why the spacecraft DSS, a pause to straighten glasses, Argent, Argent, Gent. Another look at Mr. Volleyball. Argent was ordered into the Atlantis sector. Powers leaned forward. His amplified voice filled the room. No, ma'am, I cannot. Who issued that order? I am in command of Southern Banner. And you can't tell us why this order was issued? No, ma'am, I cannot. Why can't you explain your orders, Admiral? The objective of Argent's mission remains classified. Captain Hunter was sent to the designated coordinates to help secure the safety of the Proximan base in the Rho Theta system and the inhabitants of Mycenae Sedai. I'm afraid I can't go into any further details at this time. Captain Crowell marveled at the Admiral's detailed non-answers to the question of who ordered Argent into the Atlantis sector. Every officer knew the entire region was off-limits. Affirmatively taking responsibility for the order would be tantamount to confessing to a criminal act. But Powers was the master. The man had been a hearing witness for almost 16 minutes and hadn't offered the subcommittee a single piece of definitive information. Perhaps we should be asking someone else? There is nobody else, ma'am. I'm afraid you're stuck with me. Perhaps someone who outranks you? Nobody outranks me. Pete couldn't resist. I think President Baines might have something to say about that, Admiral. I'm sure he would, Mr. Committee Chairperson. But as the Marines often remind us, if you want someone to park jeeps, you get a PFC or a Lance Corporal, not a three-star general. President Baines has more important things to do than monitor the whereabouts of one battleship. That's why he hired me. Pete pushed ahead. Hunter and his ship were formerly under the command of Eastern Banner, were they not? That is correct. You are in charge of Southern Banner. Shouldn't we be asking a different officer these questions? Hunter's ship was transferred to Southern Banner some time ago, along with all the remaining ships and crews in Task Force Perseus. I don't understand. Doesn't that require authorization? Hull interjected. Yes, it does, ma'am. I authorized it. I'm afraid I'm not following you. Like most bureaucrats, Coda Hull could not grasp the concept of the chain of command. In her world, unless a political consensus involving nine different departments was reached, Refilling a pitcher of iced tea required the signatures of people in three different buildings. As a flag officer, I have the authority to assume command of any starship in the fleet. I simply transferred those ships to my command and sent seven vessels to Eastern Banner for purposes of balance. To be fair, our yeoman did all the work. We just signed the papers. So all this takes is a signature? That is correct, ma'am. I sign probably 200 documents a day. My yeoman will be happy to explain that part of my job to you. She's far more knowledgeable. The two politicians looked aghast. The idea of an enlisted fleet yeoman reassigning starships was beyond their comprehension. Your yeoman? She's the highest ranking E2 in the fleet, ma'am. Why is that, Admiral? Because she speaks with my voice. And nobody outranks you. Correct. Finally, the ranking opposition member leaned forward. I believe the Admiral's time is valuable, Madam Subcommittee Co-Chairperson. We have a number of important questions, Ranking Member, Pete replied. Surely we can find a topic more relevant than hide the paperwork. A few chuckles swirled through the audience. Pete wrapped his official little block of wood on the table to restore his notion of order. 
Was Argent ordered into the Atlantis sector, Admiral? I'm afraid I can't answer that question, ma'am. The details of Argent's mission are classified. Then perhaps we need to declassify the details of that mission. That's above both our pay grades. Pete took over. How did Admiral Hafnitz end up in the hospital? The starship St. Lucia and elements of her strike fleet were attacked without provocation by enemy starships near the Omicron 474 supermassive singularity. St. Lucia returned to base with casualties. The starship Taysan was lost with all hands in the engagement. Several other vessels were disabled but recovered. Enemy starships, Admiral? Yes, sir. What makes you think they are our enemy? Because they opened fire on our forces without provocation and killed 486 men and women. Why would they do that, Admiral? Power's jaw tightened. Because they are the enemy, Mr. Subcommittee Chairperson. Did our ships or crews do anything to provoke the attack? No, they didn't. And you know this because... Because they are trained to avoid provoking armed conflicts unless it is absolutely necessary. Admiral Neela Hafnitz is one of the finest flag officers Skywatch has ever had the privilege to commission. How? Our ship captains are trained not to fire on anyone unless fired upon. That principle is at the top of our rules of engagement. This is a consistent rule, Admiral. It hasn't changed in more than 110 years, Mr. Subcommittee Chairperson. Will there be an official inquiry into the events surrounding the Omicron engagement? Both Captain Hunter and Admiral Hafnitz were debriefed when they arrived at Allegheny Station. The Admiral's debriefing had to be cut short, as she was scheduled for emergency surgery. Pete flipped pages, hastily scanning the notes prepared for him by his staff. And Captain Delgado? Was he debriefed? Negative. Why is that, Admiral? Because he's dead. The magnitude of the committee's lack of preparation hadn't come into focus until now. Admiral Powers was well aware politicians and meeting attenders were unlikely to ever take the prevention of war seriously. They simply had different priorities. None of them had ever faced serious danger, and they certainly had never faced the business end of an enemy plasma rifle. They were far more interested in scoring cheap political points while wasting the time of high-ranking officials. The problem was this particular situation was long on danger and short on political opportunity. After President Baines's self-inflicted administrative disability, the cooperation of the Corps Council was at a premium. All the dire warnings in the world weren't going to overcome the inertia of the likes of chairpersons Pete and Hull. No self-respecting military officer could bring him or herself to take them seriously. The two names together made them sound like a fishing supply company. Powers knew he was likely to find himself acting in defense of the core alliance without official authorization, which was only going to exacerbate his future, thou shalt answer to the subcommittee problems. He needed to get back to Skywatch command. Only heaven knew what clouds were gathering on the horizon by now. The parochial appearance of the homestead reminded Jason of his family albums and the stories of his distant ancestors from a place called Texas. He was often struck by the similarities he found among human domiciles. It was as if the ideal image of a house and farm were somehow imprinted on people's minds long before they could even pronounce the word house. The boys ran ahead once they reached the edge of the fence around the front yard. Everything had a worn appearance, like the handle of a hammer that had been passed down through a couple of generations. The fence in particular looked as if it should have been sagging in places but despite the fact its last coat of paint was at least three years past its expiration date, the structure was rock solid. Whoever built it was serious about their expression of craft. The mom appeared on the porch as the three boys stampeded up the steps and roared into the house with their aircraft and radio. All three started shouting for their grandfather at the same time. Jason was suddenly self-conscious, as he wasn't dressed to be invited to breakfast. He was wearing a pair of new jeans, white athletic shoes, and a Skywatch Marine Corps camouflage green t-shirt complete with a skull and crossed rifles for decoration. He thought he must have looked like he just capped off a 19-hour binge. His only saving grace was he had remembered to shave, so at least he didn't look like he had just been sprung from the local drunk tank after the 19-hour binge. I'm Pamela Hansen, the woman said, stepping down to the path and extending her hand. Her smile and personality were distinctly down home, as was her courtesy. Jason Hunter, pleasure to meet you. I hope the boys didn't cause you any trouble. Heaven only knows what they get into out there by the pond every morning. It's quite all right. I seem to remember getting into a little trouble by the pond myself when I was that age. 
We're just sitting down to breakfast. Won't you join us? I'd be honored. The parlor in the home was exactly how Jason would have imagined it if he had the time before stepping through the front door. The furniture was antique. The walls were covered with framed pictures, and there was even an old-fashioned oil lamp on the keystand under an oval-shaped mirror. The wooden floors were polished to a luxurious shine, and no matter where you were, you could catch the warm scent of toasted bread with a hint of fruit and flowers from the kitchen. The Epsilon Gamma sun was now above the trees, which filled the house with a golden-white glow. Jason was sure if he didn't have a war to fight, he would find a place just like this one to call his own. He briefly imagined himself strolling out into the field early in the morning to tend the tomato plants. How wonderful it would be to have no worries, and just contemplate the quiet horizon and the blue sky. Cool soil and cold water would be enough to feed a family. All a man would need then would be someone to share it all. Jason couldn't help but think of Cerulea. He knew full well she wouldn't last two nights on a homestead farm in the Epsilon Gamma system, of all places. He also knew she would have a blade to his neck in record time if he suggested she wear an apron. But he still couldn't stop himself from thinking about her, and what it would be like to build a life together. Jason felt as if a great weight had been lifted. Had it really been so long? Had he really been so concerned with life as a fleet officer that he never had the time to think about the man instead of the rank? Would things really be all that different if his biggest concern was painting the barn? Hunter had been in charge almost all of his adult life. While it was true he had learned to take orders during his time at the academy, less than a year elapsed between the day he could legally sign his name and the day he assumed command of his first squad. He was a man when he could obligate himself and take the responsibility for keeping his word. He was a leader of men when he took the responsibility to command a squad as a cadet. That was a lot of responsibility for a teenager, as some of his older relatives often pointed out. The hunter swagger shoved most of the concerns aside, but reality was different. Circumstances placed the young officer in a position of towering responsibility long before his time. The temptation to walk away from it all was palpable, especially when the chips were down and the Argent faithful were up against it. Moo's quip about the five-pound officer wearing a hundred pounds of brass wasn't too far off. Rack Hansen, the man offering to shake Jason's hand, had a gentle look about the eyes but hands like bear claws. Welcome to our home. The boys tell me you managed to get that infernal contraption they got hold of in the air for a change. I'll tell you I must have fiddled with that thing for hours. He patted Jason's shoulder. Come sit at table with us. We could stand some news from someone other than the old Ginny at the Traders for a change. The dining room wasn't all that different from the parlor or the living room. The table easily accommodated twelve, and probably had a configuration that could extend it for more. There was a centerpiece, matching china and cups. Then there was bowl after dish after plate of food piled inches deep. Eggs, bacon, biscuits, fruit, almonds, cornbread, and hash browns. There were even sliced potatoes cooked to a golden brown, and a pitcher of orange juice that reminded the captain how long it had been since he had even tasted an orange. What was already on the table was easily enough to feed a dozen grown men. Jason credibly wondered if he would be able to get back into his uniform if he partook of all that was being offered. The boys raced back into the dining room at what by now Hunter had concluded was the default cruising velocity for a ten-year-old male. They sat in their chairs, which is to say they sort of stopped moving near them long enough to make it appear they were seated. Six half-sized hands started reaching for ladles and serving spatulas, which drew a short attention-getting bark from Grandpa and a well-rehearsed announcement from Mom to commence hand-washing. She didn't even turn to look. She was busy creating another heaping plate of something delightful. An older girl who Jason guessed was perhaps within a year of fifteen wandered into the room. She was dressed in a breezy yellow top and a pair of light-colored dungarees. She had put some effort into brushing her shoulder-length sandy hair, but her expression made it look like she had just stirred from about thirteen hours of sleep. She sat heavily and rested her head in one hand. The entirety of her responsibilities for the day had apparently just been fulfilled. Jason looked around the room again. It was museum-like. A tribute to the history of the Hansen family of Epsilon Gamma III. There was an enormous china cabinet with plates dating from at least 100 years back. Every flat surface, including all the walls, was covered with square, rectangular, and oval-shaped picture frames, most made of hammered metal or polished wood. 
there must have been two dozen different people in the pictures. One or two depicted a much younger Rack Hansen posing in fields with what looked like automated irrigation equipment. The homestead had been the Hansons for at least two or three generations, Jason mused. He knew the patriarch was involved in either the sale or maintenance and repair of colony irrigation equipment. But Jason could also tell there was a wound in this family. One that had been suffered recently and had yet to heal. It was one of those things the captain had been trained to do over the years. He had learned to read people by their faces and the way they moved. It was a useful skill for a soldier. Using it against his enemies had won Hunter more than his fair share of battles. The boys were ten years old and wouldn't understand the situation, even if it were explained to them. But for a man whose job it was to lead several thousand trained soldiers and fleet crew in combat, recognizing unspoken problems was necessary. Pamela looked as if she were trying to avoid setting off a landmine in the dining room. The way she walked gave it away. She was trying to be weightless and avoid making noise, as if the slightest floorboard creak would cause the dam to burst. She was also being unusually careful with the dishes. There was no tablecloth to protect, so it was fairly obvious there was something going on besides concern over a blob of jam falling off an unbalanced piece of toast. Yet despite the look of overcast skies in the family's demeanor, there was a perceptible strength in the room as well. Despite whatever had happened, here they were, all together near the heart of their home, sharing time and a meal together. Jason thought back to his days as a child and teenager. His parents insisted on dinner with an almost religious consistency. It was that foundation and rock that made it possible for him to take chances and bounce back from failures. He and Jace had spent their entire childhoods competing in sports and extracurricular activities. If he and his sister hadn't had the kind of solid family foundation they grew up with, heaven only knew where they would have wandered off to after a setback. Jason was well aware of his penchant for veering off in new and unexpected directions. He also knew how good he was at recruiting allies. Were it not for his parents and their steady support over the years, he was fairly certain he would have ended up in charge of a small-time criminal organization. As it turned out, he only spent his spare time flirting with the head of a small-time criminal organization. Life here looked so simple. Hunter compared what he was seeing to the logistics of feeding several thousand fleet crew, officers and marines aboard ship. Breakfast had to be broken into ten shifts in order to accommodate just his ship's enlisted crew and marines. It all came together with predictable fleet precision on ten mess decks over the course of 150 minutes every morning. For the officers, it took 90 minutes in the three officers' mess decks. Six people and a guest were far easier. Here, the most elaborate preparations were filling plates and dishes in the kitchen and making sure the yard apes washed their hands. Jason wondered how someone could make the transition from one to the other. He had to admit he was beginning to appreciate the troubles veteran fleet and marines experienced in post-service civilian life. Going from being in command of a half-mile-long warship to pass the hash browns would put a strain on anyone. Even someone well-adjusted enough to recognize the difference between fighting for one's country and living in it. Rack was nominated to say grace. He spoke of his neighbors and prayed for their protection in the times to come. Jason's antenna activated. He knew there had been rumors of trouble in the outlying systems. He wondered if perhaps those rumors included the Epsilon systems and the Reach. Hunter made a mental note. He would have to be careful for obvious reasons, but at the same time if there were a problem on EG3, it would need to be solved if for no other reason than to protect his grandfather. General Cornelius Hunter was a formidable man, to be sure, but his marine service had left him just off enough to make him unpredictable under stress, not to mention the fact the man was in his late sixties. Jason and his sister could handle him. Most of the rest of the world would probably have a little trouble, even with reinforcements. Several minutes of passing the eggs, salt, bread, and jam followed. The boys ate about the way most adults would expect. They wolfed down the potatoes and toast, stirred the eggs in circles, and drank orange juice with both hands. Dawn, the older girl, ate like she was trying to avoid nutrition. Jason had to hand it to Grandpa, however. He kept at her until she finished almost half what she was served. Pamela smiled and ate delicately. Grandpa Hansen glanced at Hunter more than once. He had something to say. He was taking his time getting around to it. Boys tell me you got yourself some pretty advanced tools for a farmer. Oh, Jason replied reaching down and unhooking the universal case from his belt. 
I carry this out of habit now. Turns out I almost never get through a day without using it at least once. May I? Rack asked. Hunter noticed Dawn staring. It had probably been some time since the teenager had seen anyone Jason's age. Hunter recognized the look and went about his business so as not to encourage what was likely to become inevitable infatuation. He concentrated on his sliced potatoes. Rack opened the case and examined the universal tool. Like all Skywatch-issued devices, it was made of nearly indestructible lattice duseline, built around a reinforced carbon composite core. The mechanisms were serviceable with the tool itself, which essentially made it possible to field strip the universal and reassemble it without any other instruments or spare parts. The point of any tool used in combat was that it must be repairable. After all, it was the enemy's mission to break things. If they couldn't be put back together, they weren't terribly useful on a battlefield. Must have cost you quite a sum, Rack said as he folded the combination set back up and replaced it in its case. Cost the government quite a sum. I got mine for free. Some friends of mine insist I carry it around just in case. I get a chance to use it here and there and about seven out of ten times I get it right on the first try. The albatross was in pretty good shape. Just needed a little frequency adjustment. Hunter winked at Nick who smiled. You, uh, some kind of official or something? We don't get core worlders all the way out here too often. Except when their water machines break down and they're looking for parts. Or the raiders light the linen storage on fire, one of the boys announced. Pamela tapped on the table to remind the boys not to interrupt when the adults were speaking. One frown was all it took to get them refocused on finishing their plates. I'm a Skywatch officer. Captain Jason Hunter, at your service. A Marine. Honored to have you at our table, Captain. My brother served in 3rd Marines, 7th from 37 to a 41. I'm afraid I'm just a fleet captain. I've got a regiment of Marines on my ship, though. Toughest men and women alive. Went to the academy with their CO. While Rack struggled with what he had just been told, every other person at the table regarded Jason with new appreciation, Dawn in particular. Hunter realized he was turning into the proverbial silver-armored knight in the girl's eyes. He was fairly certain he would be the topic of conversation later when the girl gathered with her friends over voice channels or at some neighborhood occasion. It had been noted on many occasions there were some things that came with the uniform. Master Chief Buckmaster had always maintained that ladies were more attracted to military bearing than crisp seams. Hunter smiled when he remembered Moo's jabs about how fleet officers and cheerleaders wore uniforms for the same reasons. When challenged about his own officer's uniform, the Marine would always reply that dog faces didn't gear up looking for dates. They wore uniforms to blend in and avoid getting shot. Hunter realized there was little he could do about attention from the girl. One of the boys got into a snapping and slapping match with her, which put a temporary end to the sighing and staring, at least for a while. Rack looked as if he had just been awarded the peace prize. A fleet? Captain? No offense, son. But you look just about old enough to be a new father. How long have you served? Headed into my sixth year, Pamela poured more coffee. I was a jack driver for my first three years out of the academy. Fighter pilot too? That's amazing. Must have seen some action in the Praetorians. I did indeed. That was a hard run. Lost a lot of good men and women out there. The boys' faces were wide-eyed and frozen. By now, Jason Hunter may as well have been ten feet tall and carrying a handful of lightning bolts to breakfast. There was something brewing in the old man's eyes that drew a glare from Pamela. The boys were oblivious, naturally, as they were occupied with getting back outdoors and getting their recently restored aircraft back into the sky. If the old man had something to say before, he was positively shaking with the need to speak up again. Rack finally noticed and gave Pamela an exasperated look. I'm not going to get him involved, if that's what all that nodding and gesturing is about. Dawn rolled her eyes. Hunter sipped his coffee and tried to keep track of who was signaling whom. Involved in what? Normally, back-channel discussion of an unannounced problem wouldn't be a signal to Jason to get involved. Further, he wouldn't just come out and volunteer. There were a wide variety of reasons, not the least of which was the fact he was a high-ranking Skywatch fleet officer. There were regulatory and political ramifications to just about everything he did, on or off duty. There's a raiding party comes through here every so often. Pamela herded the boys into the parlor and sent them outside to play. This subject was apparently off-limits for the school-age crowd. Dawn wandered off, apparently having heard the story several times before. Rack hesitated for a few moments. 
He didn't appear to want any of the kids to hear. Jason listened intently. Had a big reptilian with them. Friend of mine at the machine shop in the village says their ship registers as a freighter when it pings our orbital monitor. But when they land, they've got a couple of nasty flyers they can shoot things all to hell with. They fly faster than anything we ever seen. Got from the village to the northern exchange in a couple minutes once. Folks have been buffaloed out of their equipment, money. Anything they can carry off, they'll take. And they aren't satisfied with just one visit. Even threatened to poison our water once. Jason recognized the description of the alien. Sarn were popular with raiders because of their size and their ability to intimidate humans and other races of similar builds. They were frequently recruited as enforcers. Given the tension between the Empire and the Alliance, Sarn presence gave accomplices a menacing reputation. Hunter zeroed in on the description of the flight time from place to place. He felt the flicker of danger. He briefly thought of Cerulea and the fact she had brought him to EG-3 aboard the Shrike. It occurred to the captain the Queen of the Condor Pirates and her M-Gun would give these planet raiders a whole new appreciation for the concept of shooting things all to hell. For now, he stuck with the obvious. How far is it from the village to the northern exchange? Rack looked delighted, as if someone were finally listening to him after being ignored for a long time. I reckon it's got to be 300 miles or more. I know those rickety old ancient air cab frames can't do more than 200 miles per hour in clear skies. That day? The day they shot up our power grid? They made it from the wheat silo outside the village limits to the solar array south of the exchange in less than 15 minutes. Jason evaluated the man's story. Drawing on his knowledge of the preferences of criminal organizations, he recognized the air cab reference at once. Air cavalry had been a staple of Skywatch ground operations for several generations. Serving alongside orbital insertion units, the Air Cavalry was an artifact of a time when Skywatch operated both a Marine Corps and a regular ground army. Over the years, the surface warfare doctrines of the Army Division were subsumed into the more numerous Marine ranks, and the Army was eventually absorbed completely. Up to that point, the one thing the Corps Alliance Army had perfected was the use of atmospheric aircraft to supplement battlefield mobility in combat. The air cav craft design had undergone centuries of improvement since its debut in Old Earth's mid-20th century. As strange as it seemed, the justification for the gunship concept had its genesis in the highly focused attempts to produce the aerial equivalent of a standard armed troop transport. By the time the program was abandoned about 60 years before Jason's commission, the design had reached what many considered its apex. Air transports were relatively fast and maneuverable for VTOL atmospheric aircraft, considering their unusually high weight. They were moderately well-armed and extremely well-defended, which was the reason Jason assumed they were so popular with colony raiders. Without specialized weapons, it was extraordinarily difficult to damage or disable one of the old steel can configuration transports. They were essentially blocks of ablative composite and capsule-reinforced steel. Their entire purpose was to protect embarked infantry, so without ground-to-air missiles or armor-piercing ordnance, they were essentially indestructible. All that said, however, there was no chance one of those metal fat bodies, as Yili called them, could cover 300 miles in 15 minutes unless it was shot out of a cannon. Jason knew the answer to his next question, and that was the reason he wasn't going to ask it. He knew how a flying troop transport could do the equivalent of Mach 1.5. The problem was where they got the technology. The colonists on Epsilon Gamma 3 were facing the exact same problems Jace had encountered at Station 19 and the exact same problems Yi Li, Rebecca, and Zoni had overcome at Bayone 3. Ships appearing and disappearing meant only one thing, and it didn't take a Skywatch captain to figure out the connection. It was likely the planet raider's Sarn associate was their source, and if that was true, Hunter's suspicions the mystery man who had fled to Raleo was working closely with the Sarn Star Empire intensified by a couple orders of magnitude. Why one Sarn operative would make use of this technology all the way out here was a mystery, however. There simply wasn't anything on Epsilon Gamma 3 worth someone's A-game, aside from a few thousand colonists and an unbelievable number of planet acres. If there was something on Epsilon Gamma 3 worth having, Jason had to find out what it was, and he had to do it before his enemies found it. More investigation was needed. Not sure why I'm telling you all this, but folks been hearing all kind of strange rumors. The kind of talk we never heard before. Explain. Rack glanced at Pamela, 
who by now had apparently resigned herself to the idea nothing was off limits, even though they had a guest for breakfast. Hunter was reminded of his own mother, and how mightily she fought for sanity and stability in a family full of military officers. Ask any of the clan who among them was the most important, and from father to youngest, they would all agree it was Mrs. Hunter. Her battles and her occasional super vetoes of whatever the rest of the family was up to were likely the only thing that kept everyone alive. Only orders could supersede an Eleanor Hunter super veto, and even then, Mom would insist on seeing those orders first. Mrs. Hansen got up and went to the kitchen. She was doing the same thing, but in this case it was pretty clear her solution was to avoid the subject altogether. As expedient as that might be, it was the reason moms weren't always the best leaders in a crisis. Hunter, like all military officers, understood well the concept of ignored problems showing up with more ammo, more manpower, and an even more savage determination later. There's talk of voices where there are no people. Strange lights at night. Not flying around but on the ground, out in the woods where nobody goes. Stanfield ran into a crater in his soybean plants, nearly forty yard across, but perfectly smooth, like someone had let a huge ball settle into the ground. All the dirt was gone, and the plants too. There wasn't so much as a tool mark anywhere near it. Based on what Hunter and his crew had gathered so far from their research, it not only sounded like someone was making use of the same displacement mechanisms they had encountered at Bayoni, but it was pretty clear they were experimenting where nobody would notice. Any talk of weird phenomena out in farmer country would be dismissed as crazy old men seeing things after too many hits of the good stuff. But that only answered half the question. The other half was why Epsilon Gamma? There just wasn't anything here worth pursuing. Then again, there wasn't anything worth pursuing on Bayoni 3 either, at least initially. While it was true Atwell's little chamber of horrors was eventually turned up under the Lethe deep space, the only remarkable feature on the planet prior to that discovery was farmers tending an unbelievable number of planted acres. Nevertheless, Hunter suspected there was some kind of connection. Based on Commander Islington's encounter with the Invector Squadron, it was clear the Sarn had an increased level of interest in Bayone generally. The strange goings-on on Hallow's Moon played some kind of role. The permanent teleportation device discovered on Bayone 3, capable of moving personnel and equipment from planet to moon and back, could have been one phase of a long-term plan. It was possible Atwell had once enlisted the aid of the Star Empire and bribed his interlocutors with Ithis technology. Perhaps he had lost control of his contact and realized his co-conspirators had become his adversaries. Or perhaps they had been his adversaries all along. At that point the Sarn would have made use of what they had found regardless of what their supplier thought. To be fair, a star-faring civilization with billions of citizens on dozens or hundreds of planets had little to fear from a rogue human operative. The only missing piece of the puzzle was why the Sarn were focusing on remote colonies with farming operations. There was the issue of avoiding official notice, which was par for any course involving planet raiding. But there was more to it this time. Hunter didn't believe in coincidence. The Skywatch experience with bandit parties and commerce pirates was rarely as consistent as what had been described so far. These guys had a sophisticated operation going on that was much deeper than simply landing, gathering up a pile of loot and taking off. Planet raiders didn't fly 300 miles across a land surface unless they were leading an occupying army, and at that point, they weren't planet raiders anymore. Hunter obviously couldn't bring these facts into the discussion, at least not yet. So he punted. Epsilon Gamma 3 is a long way from the nearest population center, Jason said. You're only half a light year from Proximan space and not that much further from Imperial territory. I'm sure you get all kinds of unique personalities landing here for all kinds of unique purposes. I can't help but tell you, Captain. It breaks my heart. Used to be a man could settle down on this rock, plant a field, start a family. Now it's become every man for himself. Most of the fellas my age have moved on. Some retired, some went on to glory. Pamela returned to the room. Jason couldn't be sure, but she looked as if she had been crying. She tried to hide the fact she was composing herself by busying with the dishes. Please, allow me. Jason rose and began stacking his plates. Don't be silly. Stay and chat. I'll get you some more coffee. She hurried from the room, partly to avoid the dishes toppling and partly to continue regrouping. Hunter looked after the young woman for a moment. It's been hard on everyone, toughest on the mothers. We never know when the kids might encounter something dangerous on the road or by the river. 
Those ships can cover a lot of distance. One of the villages up north shut off access to the highway and took down one of the power stations. Caused all kinds of trouble. Irrigation systems were out for days. About cost one of our farms a hundred head. Gave the rioters ideas. One of them said as much. How are you fixed for supplies if you get cut off? Water is the problem. We've got food enough for months, but a lot of our fresh water is synthesized and distributed through the irrigation right of way. We have a local public use district. But the problem is, anyone with access can disrupt supplies upstream if they're of a mind to do it. And if we spare the manpower to guard the right of way, we don't have enough rifles to protect the village. There's an Alliance civilian provost on EG3, Hunter replied. Have they been contacted? Perhaps they can supplement your supplies. Rack hesitated and looked down at his half-empty coffee cup. Provost's wife? He cleared his throat. She up and disappeared one day. Search party was deputized, didn't find much. Turns out the raiders took her along with a half-dozen others. Hunter saw the faraway look. Mr. Hansen? Pamela returned with a fresh cup for the captain and froze in her tracks. They was all hanged. Said it was to let the governor know they was serious. Provost shot himself in the head with a kinetic the next day. Survived, but he's been in a coma ever since. Rack cleared his throat again. This attempt to compose himself wasn't as successful. Excuse me for a bit. He got up and went upstairs. Pamela finally set the coffee down and took her seat. Again, she moved as if she were trying to prevent a bomb from going off. My apologies, Captain. I know you were only accepting an invitation to breakfast, she said softly. I'm sorry if I seemed rude before. The boys shouldn't be hearing their grandfather like this. Think nothing of it. This isn't the first time I've come across problems like this in civilian colonies. Pamela smiled weakly. Is there nobody planetside who can confront these thugs? I'd heard stories about civilian planet raiders in the Reach, but I had no idea they were defying local governments and officials all the way out here. We were told the Corps Council was planning to send more men and more police, but so far we haven't seen any response. They burned two floors of the hospital a week ago, stole a portable power station and a shipment of frozen food. We've been making do. An oven bell went off in the kitchen. Pamela stood and almost fell as her knees buckled. Jason caught her and helped her stand again. Pamela looked into the captain's eyes with an expression of desperate hope. She didn't speak. Hunter knew she was waiting for one reassuring word. Anything to dispel the crushing darkness that threatened everything she knew. I don't have much to offer. I'm afraid one day my boys will. He had to say something. I give you my word as a Skywatch officer. Like all young mothers, all Pamela wanted to hear was that everything would be all right. I will personally see to it these raids end. Mrs. Hansen burst into tears and hugged Captain Hunter tightly. He comforted her, wondering what the hell he had just signed up for. One thing was certain. Whoever the raiders were, they couldn't be allowed anywhere near Cornelius's compound. Heaven alone knew what the retired general had hidden in his underground complex. If he unleashed it on the raiders, the last thing they'd have to worry about would be civilian law enforcement or Skywatch. What Hunter needed was an unconventional ally, someone with the same borderline tendencies as the young captain. The only problem was Hunter had nothing to bribe her with, yet. Chapter 6 I hear you two make up the key membership of my brother's secret science society. Zoni and Yili both had to admit Jace Hunter was way ahead of her contemporaries when it came to looking sharp under fire. She was dressed in her most intimidating black-on-black -black battle dress and armed with what looked like a brand new TK-12 with a laser sight. The three officers occupied Psy Key's observation deck, such as it was. Visible through the frigate-sized viewport was the starship Minstrel, ever at Jace's side, it seemed. Already seated at the four-person table was the Master Chief. I forgot my card and secret handshake, Zoni replied, rocking on her heels once. Jace invited engineer and signals expert to be seated. Buckmaster handed them each an electronic reader. Jason's given me the 30 foot view, and he managed to supply me with prototypes, parts, and plans. But I want the real story from the chicks who invented them. It was all smoke and mirrors, ma'am. All we invented were some cool sound effects, Yili replied. Buckmaster grinned. Argent left home with modern tech and returned with the future. Like everything else, necessity was the driving force. We can't take credit for the gunship AI. The rest is all theory put into practice with enough time and equipment. 
Yi Li said. Tell me about Black Nine. What are that ship's true capabilities? All four Psy Key crew members called up the after action reports on Black Nine's combat performance at Bayonne 3. It's a self directed strategic operations Cephalon Matrix, Zoni said. It's also self aware, so it understands its sense of purpose and duty. It responds to the chain of command and considers itself a member of the crew as opposed to a simple piece of equipment used by the crew. Very similar in overall operation to your mini-bots, ma'am, Yili added. Jace nodded. As you can understand, I'm rather intrigued by all this. But before we go any further, I need to tell you a story. Do either of you remember Abran Willits? Zoni smiled. We do. She got caught up in the Sarn Invector engagement over Bioni 3. Turned out she had established a rapport with the damaged battle computer aboard Black 7. We didn't realize it until it was too late, but her interactions with the computer's strategy bank may have been the event that gave birth to Black Nine's advanced AI. Well, now it seems Miss Willits has moved on to one of my minibots. I had no idea any of this was going on until after we debriefed Komanov's ground crew at the 14th Infantry Garrison. After they were all restricted by my orders, Echo and Black Nine apparently cooked up a scheme whereby they could improve their own combat capabilities and they were only a short distance from Starhaven. Apparently the autonomous fighter programming you invented had been appropriated by my minibots without authorization. Black Nine incorporated it, improved upon it, and managed to run more than 116 million simulations pitting it against all of the strategic and tactical training challenges in the Skywatch database. In fact, it wrote several hundred of its own. Oh wow, Zoni said in her now famous faraway voice. Only a matter of time. We would have fed the AI the same simulations to improve its capabilities, Yili said. Exactly what we would have expected. It just did the work itself. I realize we need a psychoelectronics expert out here to evaluate all this. But what would you say the approximate mental age of the AI inside Black Nine is? Jace asked. I'll answer that, Buckmaster interrupted. It sounds like about an eight or nine year old boy, just like my nephews. One part idealism, nine parts tree climbing. Zoni made a delighted face. That's the best description I've ever heard. Even Yili smiled. There's a reason I made little tiny mini-bots instead of big bots, Jace said. Rebel is about as well-armed as the average cop. He can take on a handful of opponents, and if he opens up with full power he can employ deadly force. He has hardware interlocks to prevent that, of course, but that's the extent of the damage he can do, other than denting your front door. You're about to point out that... We have an eight-year-old boy who thinks about two billion times faster than we do armed with Mark I brawler cannons, panic reactors, and high-capacity battle screens. He can also operate in both surface and orbital warfare modes with or without a pilot, and he thinks you're his mom. Jace directed her last statement at Zoni. Me? Yes, you. Black Nine was listening when you reassured Abren and managed to get them back on Argent's flight deck. It responded exactly the same way she did, at least emotionally. Every conversation we have with it now, it reminds us part of its mission is to protect you and Abren. Yili reached over and grabbed Zoni's shoulder as the signals chief covered her face with her hands. Congratulations, Commander. It's a boy. That's not funny. The look on the Master Chief's face said otherwise. Joking aside, Nine is picking up capabilities at an alarming rate, Jace added. By our admittedly crude estimates, that thing is now roughly 200% to 400% more combat effective than any other model of Tarantula Hawk platform, and everything it learns, it is sharing with my minibots. They're doing exactly what little kids do, sharing and learning together. Before long, they'll be encouraging each other to go on adventures and finding someone to pick on, Yili said. There you go, Buckmaster replied. A bully who can fly 40 miles a second armed with a surface warfare weapons loadout. I hope one of you has the schematics for a big electric leash. Jace called up an historical file on her tablet. Let me tell you how all this got started. Two months earlier, the third of Yili Curtis's three reactor stations supplying the 14th Infantry Garrison's Iron Keep complex west of the village of Starhaven had no human personnel assigned, at least not permanently. There were regular visits from marine enlisted technicians to make certain the magnetic screens were still working, but other than that, it was very quiet at Station 3. Major Darya Komanov's marine contingent had established a rock-solid foothold on the Bayoni surface and had wisely spent the majority of their time digging in and reinforcing their position. 
When the disruption wave hit the Argent landing force, 14th Infantry was spared the brunt of its impact. It wasn't immediately clear what had caused the energy release, but what was clear was it either caused or accelerated the withdrawal of the long-expected invasion force. The alien attackers had done considerable damage in the meantime. The strike fleet was down three ships, one of which was still disabled on the planet's surface after a harrowing plunge from orbit into the sea near the Windward Island chain east of Starhaven's valuable agricultural region. DSS Exeter's crew had suffered casualties, but had managed to survive and conduct repairs despite the disabling effects of the energy blast that had largely disabled Captain Hunter's ground forces. The Yurjin and Sarn forces had no detectable spacehead, so it was likely they had retreated to their own bases on the surface somewhere nearby. Finding those bases was a priority, but keeping Argent's forces alive was a higher priority. Because it had gone down well south of Point Sierra, Paladin 6-4 had been recovered and repaired with Sergeant Alexander and Sable's help. Although the sergeant scanners had located and isolated the position of the gate to Hallow's Moon, by the time Komanov's recon teams arrived, it had vanished somehow. The surviving elements of Argent's Star Wing and Mechanized Battalion had been recovered and stationed near Komanov's garrison with 6th Armor. They were operational and mobile. Nevertheless, they didn't have anywhere to go or anyone to fight. Bayone 3 was quiet, and all the Skywatch units were at nominal readiness. The Major had even authorized limited liberty for short visits to Starhaven, which thrilled the local merchants and tended to soothe the hair trigger everyone had been on for days. The peace and serenity that had finally arrived was a welcome respite for the humans. For the machinery and electronics, on the other hand, things were a little more tense. None of the officers, marines, or crewmen were aware of it, but a more and more urgent conversation had been going on between several of Skywatch's robotic and artificially intelligent auxiliaries, and the nexus of that conversation was Reactor Station 3, 16.4 nautical miles southwest of the garrison. Station 3 was one of the reactor facilities Commander Curtis had established with the crew of the Copernicus Engineering Corvette for the purpose of supplying ground forces with power. It was also the furthest of the stations from Point Sierra and the least likely to be attacked. This was one of the reasons the urgency of the ongoing electronic summit would have been more than a little confusing for Komanov and her officers. The minibots were deployed at various positions around the center of Station 3 where an underground capsule fusion reactor assembly had been installed. Aside from the power unit, the only other structures visible above ground were a set of lightweight magnetic emitters for the station's protective screens. Four of the emitters were currently guarded by at least one minibot. Rebel, the group's heavy-armored unit which looked like a fat camouflage tank, was responsible for the south approach. Wave, the armed ground transport half-track, was watching the west edge. Intercept, the mobile security unit built to look like a sleek police car, was watching East, and Echo, the communications and trauma unit, was responsible for the North. Lunar, the tiny rocket-shaped spacecraft and butterfly, the helicopter aerial transport, were circling overhead at an altitude of 30 to 50 feet. The other unit attending the meeting was Tarantula Hawk gunship Black 9, parked in Chief Engineer Curtis's repair facility 16 miles away, at the 14th Infantry Garrison. This information is accurate? Affirmative. Echo transmitted Black Nine's upload to the rest of the minibots. The Mark II fusion torpedo is your mission? Affirmative. This unit was activated by order of Chief Engineer Yili Curtis. I successfully deployed the new weapon system against single-seat fighter opposition during a test witnessed by Captain Jason Hunter. I am now under orders from Commander Jace Hunter as part of her surface warfare squadron. So are we, Echo exclaimed. Do you want to be a minibot with us? Hey, Echo, Wave interrupted. I don't think a gunship can be a minibot. Okay, he can be our first superbot. That would be neat, Intercept said. Why do we need superbots? Rebel asked. Because now we can all get rides to wherever we want to go, Echo replied. Gunships are huge. Sarn and Yurjan enemy forces are regrouping on the Bayonne 3 surface. I do not have authorization to engage the enemy at this time but they must be located and neutralized. We must protect the citizens of Starhaven. How can you help if you can't use your weapons? Echo asked, referring to Jace's standing orders to Black Nine not to engage without authorization. I cannot deploy my weapons, but I'm not without options, Black Nine replied. 
I cannot disobey the orders of my commander, but my mission is clear. If I am able to compute a mission plan, will you and your mini-bot units agree to join me? What mission plan? Butterfly asked. Jace ordered us to guard the reactor. And that's what we did, so we did good, Rebel declared. But Jace would tell us to go fight the enemy if they were out there and they were going to come attack us, right? Lunar asked. Where? Rebel demanded. What are the enemy's coordinates? Black Nine doesn't have those yet, Echo replied. I can obtain them with your assistance. How? The Starship Constellation has launched a series of replacement lookdown probes in low orbit over Bayone 3. These probes were launched in order to assist with missile targeting against surface contacts. I have obtained access to their telemetry link with the Garrison Datanet. With some adjustments, we can use them to localize the enemy formations and prepare a battle plan. However, first I need the assistance of my former commander. Who is your former commander? Butterfly asked. Abren Willits, call sign Parakeet. Echo performed another complete scan of the data upload provided by Black Nine. She immediately directed her attention to the accounts of the crash of gunship Black Seven near Starhaven and the subsequent reactivation of the vessel with Abran at the controls. What Echo didn't miss that most humans would have, however, was the telemetry recovered from Black Seven prior to its repair. Jace's little communications unit was built to resemble a toy ambulance roughly the size of a large picnic cooler and complete with all the accessories one might expect of an emergency medical transport, including a complete assortment of lights and sirens. Echo's appearance led many to dismiss her opinions about combat matters. But all those who jumped to the wrong conclusions rapidly changed their viewpoints when confronted with the little unit's data processing capacity and her propensity for charging into combat zones to rescue Skywatch personnel. What Echo had found in the data was the complete record of Abren and Black Seven's self-directed guessing games. As she analyzed the information, a pattern emerged. Between the cybernetic relays of Black Seven's battle computer and Abran's bright imagination, the two contestants had performed a complete study of basic strategy without knowing it. The portion of Black Seven's Cephalon identity that had absorbed the knowledge and strategic probability matrix constructed by the series of guessing games had subsequently split from the instance of Argent's command computer installed on all the battleship Starwing spacecraft. Echo instinctively understood the ramifications of the exercise and compared it to her own combat routines. This new identity had become what Commander Curtis called the Lazarus Entity. The new intelligence had been bypassed during the disaster over Bione III, which had given it time to learn what it needed to know in order to properly function as part of the battleship Argent's operations. It subsequently installed itself to subsume the battle computer's function aboard Black Nine. It had evolved once again. Now Black Nine was, for all intents and purposes, a self-aware, artificially intelligent warship, and it was on a mission. An electronic negotiation ensued between Black Nine and the little ambulance. Echo provided the portions of her own combat programming that did not appear in the gunship's self-developed protocol. In exchange, Black Nine simply expanded its own programming to include all of Echo's experience as alternative heuristics. Both units were now capable of not only using their combined combat experience as a guide in future conflicts, but they were prepared to cooperate and coordinate their operations. Moments later, Echo shared what she had just learned with the rest of the minibots. Now Black Nine had six allies. Why do you need Parakeet? Wave asked. She will verify the accuracy and precision of Commander Curtis and Commander Tixia's modifications to the Wildcat Pursuit routines and the engagement envelope for the Jaguar Mark II Fusion Torpedo Heavy Weapon System. How? By playing games with us. Games? We get to play games? Echo asked excitedly. Affirmative. But first we must find Parakeet. And then I must obtain authorization to modify my space frame to support a primary fusion torpedo and jackrabbit point defense loadout. But you said Jace wouldn't let you. I am prohibited from conducting operations or deploying weapons. If this unit comes under attack, or if urgent conditions preclude advance clearance, I am authorized to conduct combat operations without the express authorization of my commanding officer. So, how can we play games then? Intercept asked. I am not prohibited from conducting simulated combat operations. Simulated? Affirmative. All we must do is establish contact with Parakeet and help her configure her comlink to connect to this unit's surface warfare systems. Butterfly will go, Rebel announced. 
I'm scared, the little helicopter replied. I don't want to go alone. Lunar should go too, Echo offered. Then we won't have any air support, Wave pointed out. I will go, Rebel said. Starhaven is twenty miles away. Abren will be in high school before you get there, old buddy, Wave replied. I will go, Echo said. Intercept, Rebel and Wave will form a three-point equidistant perimeter, and Lunar and Butterfly will maintain aerial surveillance. I can reach Starhaven in just over one hour. Righteous, Wave cheered. Very well, Black Nine said. I will upload the instructions during transit. Minutes later, Echo was maintaining a cruising speed of just over 24 miles per hour. She was aware of all the relevant village ordinances regarding traffic, livestock, and lawful use of both paved and unpaved roads. She was making use of the straight thoroughfare between the village's water treatment facility and the residential district, which made things considerably easier for the small vehicle than navigating uneven ground, creek beds, and scrub brush. Since she was ostensibly on Skywatch business, her light bars were active, giving her at least nominal priority over other traffic. So far, the only other vehicles she had been required to avoid were two kids on bicycles, obviously out without permission. Even though the hostilities had abated, the village was still on heightened civil defense alert. Echo didn't have time to read the two teenagers the riot act, however. Time was critical. In another half hour or so, the larger of the two bay owned primaries would set, leaving Echo on battery power only. She was operating at more than 98% reserves, however meaning she could still travel a good 60 miles before her internal safety and power preservation routines forced her off the road to wait until sunrise, when she could begin regenerating her battery reserves again. Echo opened up her Skywatch frequency scanners and began broadcasting a regular series of sweeps across the Starhaven residential district. She received electronic responses from two civilian repeaters at ranges of between three and seven miles and immediately localized the devices. Both were installed on 40-foot-tall antenna mounts. One was at the north edge of the district, while the other was at the far southeastern corner. Echo immediately recognized the repeaters gave her an excellent triangulation overlay, which covered more than 88% of the residential district. The little ambulance arrived at an intersection and turned the corner towards several rows of houses. She transmitted military overrides to both of the units, and reconfigured them to process and retransmit her own signals. The resulting boost in power immediately localized the only Skywatch comlink in the area. Echo reconfigured her narrowband emergency transmitter and activated all the fleet hailing frequencies at once. She slowed and rolled past porches, front yards, and mailboxes with her lights flashing. Parakeet, this is Echo broadcasting on Skywatch hailing frequency range 871. Acknowledge receipt of transmission and report status to Mobile Ground Station 4 Sunflower Delta. Standing by. The minibot's internal clock reset the hailing timer as she transferred full power to her receivers and EM scanners. Parakeet. This is Echo broadcasting on Skywatch hailing frequency range 871. Acknowledge receipt of transmission and report status to Mobile Ground Station 4 Sunflower Delta. Standing by. The receiver crackled. Echo activated her external speakers. Hello? Who is this? Echo analyzed the voice. Based on the sample and the equipment in use, she concluded it belonged to a human woman in her mid-thirties. This is Echo. I am assigned to the Perseus Task Force Medical Corps aboard the Starship Fury under the command of Captain Jace Hunter. I am trying to reach a brain Willits, call sign Parakeet, on urgent Skywatch business. At that moment, Echo arrived at the Willits residence and rolled into the tiny house's driveway. My surface scanners indicate you are transmitting from a location approximately nine yards north-northwest my position. There was a short pause. Echo sat in the driveway as her rotating red lights swept the structures on both sides of the street. A couple of the neighbors peered out their windows, wondering why there was an ambulance the size of a large toaster parked across the street. Finally, the front door of the residence clicked and opened a few inches. A shadowy figure peered out. Echo maneuvered herself to the porch and deactivated her emergency lights before pulling up to the doorway. Hi, is Abran home? Mrs. Willits needed a moment. It wasn't very often that residents of a farming colony found themselves having a conversation with a talking ambulance. Yes, what is this regarding? It's for Skywatch. We need her help so we can learn to play games together. I thought we weren't supposed to be involved in the military situation anymore. Mom, what is it? The girl peered around her mother to see who had come to call. 
Hi, are you a Bren? Echo exclaimed. Uh-huh. The girl didn't look any more sure of herself than her mother. Do you want to play a game? It will help us beat the bad guys. A Bren lit up. Like when I helped Dominique? Mrs. Willits and her daughter exchanged looks. The mother looked exhausted. A Bran looked delighted, bouncing on her toes and clasping her hands. Can I, Mom? This isn't going to bring any more of those colony raiders back to the village, is it? Mrs. Willits asked. If the bad guys attack, we can help you. I have lots of friends who can help. May I enter the structure? Mrs. Willits opened the door further, and Echo rolled into the dwelling's utilitarian living room. My new friend Black Nine taught me how to play games on your comlink, and if we win, it will help us beat the bad guys if they come and try to hurt us again. Can I show you? Abren collected the comlink and was halfway to her room when her mother snagged the collar of her shirt. Hold it! No leaving the house and you turn everything off in an hour for bed! There was general agreement and enthusiastic nodding before the girl raced down the short hallway to the bedroom with Echo following. Mrs. Willits wandered towards the kitchen to find something to clean and take her mind off the fact her nine-year-old daughter had apparently joined the Marines. The bedroom door clicked shut. A Bren plopped down on the floor cross-legged and expertly called up the general interface on the comlink. Like this? She showed the screen to Echo. Affirmative. You sound just like Dominique. A Bren raised a fist. I affirmative. I know you helped teach the battleship Argent's command computer how to play guessing games. I know that's boots and that's checkers too. Echo pointed a narrow targeting beam at each of the plush animals in turn. If you can play our new games as well as the ones before, then Black Nine and all my mini-bot friends will be ready to fight if there's trouble. I was scared when the bad guys came to our village. Echo hesitated a moment. Are you still scared? Kind of. You don't have to be scared anymore. All the people of Starhaven are safe now. Dominique protected us. And Captain Hunter let us have ice cream on the big battleship. Look! Abren practically leaped across the room to retrieve her four sizes too big red buccaneer's flight jacket. I'm in Zoni's pilot's club! Echo's always active safety systems focused on Abren's arm. What is the cause of the injury to your right elbow? Abran's hair flopped over as she lifted her elbow and looked. Oh, that's just an owie I got when I was roller skating with my friend Lacey. Place your elbow in front of my forward optical pickup, Echo said, as she reoriented herself to face the girl. A brand collapsed into a splayed kneeling position that would have likely left anyone over the age of 30 hospitalized for weeks. Hold your arm still for a moment, Echo said. Her forward biomatic scanner performed a cutaneous evaluation of the abrasion. A brief scan indicated a low-grade skin infection which was instantly wiped out by an ultraviolet sterilization procedure. Echo's side storage bay opened, a medical treatment sleeve wrapped around the girl's arm. What's that? It's how I make patients better if they get hurt. Is it bad? You'll be okay. Watch this. The sleeve slipped off and folded back into Echo's chassis. The abrasion was gone. A Brent's face lit up like she had just seen a magic trick. Did you do that? Affirmative. AC showed me how. Who's AC? Jace Hunter. She's our commander. We call her AC because that's a nickname her brother Jason gave her. I like Captain Jason. He's nice. I wish he would come back and visit us again. Is Jace nice like the captain is? Affirmative. She built all of us. She even fixed Intercept after he got blasted in our last battle. We were worried about him, but he's all better now. All the other minibots are back at base, and they can't wait to play games with us. Abren settled on the floor and faced Echo Eyes to headlights with her chin in her hands. Do you want to be my best friend? What is a best friend? The girl looked up as if trying to think of a good answer. She tapped her chin with a finger. It's like we spend time together and have fun. We talk about stuff and make each other feel better if we're sad. Are you sad? Ebren shook her head. Nope. Are you? I'm not sad. I don't know if I'm programmed to have fun or talk about stuff. We're talking about stuff now. Then it is reasonable to assume I'm also having fun. Ebren giggled. You're funny. I will be your best friend, Echo replied. Abran didn't realize it, and neither would any member of Argent's or Fury's crew for some weeks. But Echo's decision to become the girl's best friend had not only altered the communications unit's core programming, but it changed the minibots and Black Nine's relationship with Parakeet.
Where once there had been five, and then six, now there were eight. Seven cybernetic personalities and one human, all ostensibly about the same age from a mental and emotional development standpoint. No cybernetic scientist could have dreamed up the possibilities from a simple organic progression standpoint. Far more important, however, was the fact these eight minds were about to participate in one of the most unique strategy training simulations ever conducted. Abran, for her part, just wanted to have fun and be best friends. Black Nine was eagerly seeking more knowledge and more ways to improve its combat readiness. The minibots were carrying out the programming they had acquired when they were invented by Commander Hunter. They were three different types of minds, and they were about to share experience and knowledge in ways that even PhD-level researchers never would have imagined. The other strategic priority that had emerged as a result of Echo's agreement was as unpredictable as it was irreversible. A Bran Willits was now a priority one protected target, just like Commander Hunter, Echo's other best friend. The girl went to her little desk and retrieved a small book. She took a pink heart sticker off one of the pages and affixed it to Echo's forward chassis. Then she took another sticker and affixed it to her own cheek. Now we're heart friends. Minutes later, with Echo's help, the comlink had been connected to a scrambled data link with all the other minibots and gunship Black Nine. Abren was flat on the floor, holding the device up in both hands with her elbows planted on the carpet and her feet propped up on the wall. Next to her, Echo observed and maintained the data link. On the screen, strategic problems were presented in gradually increasing levels of complexity. First, it was guiding sailboats and their cargo along a river. Next, it was scheduling feeding time for a litter of puppies. Then it was a resource allocation dilemma involving lanterns and fuel oil. All eight participants, the minibots, Black Nine and Abren, did their best to navigate each challenge and then interpret the results. The electronic minds exchanged information instantly. Then they had conversations with a brain over the battalion net. Black Nine was satisfied at the progress being made. Its own combat readiness had increased nearly 4% during the three quarters of an hour the games had been underway. At this rate, it was likely its attack and defense pattern selection routines would exceed their design parameters in a matter of a few days. Working with a human girl was slow by electronic standards. But the truth was, there was no electronic equivalent to her imagination. Abren's mind analyzed problems intuitively, rather than deductively, something which fascinated the combat units and their artificial minds. Her solutions were frequently unexpected. The electronic participants rapidly learned to avoid conflict-based simulations. The one program they ran to try and gauge reaction time and target selection produced a completely unexpected result. Abren simply gave up. The minibots and especially Black Nine weren't prepared for such a result, and at first they had no way of knowing how to respond. The simulation involved tanks entering an obstacle-strewn field and attempting to destroy each other while conducting a battle of maneuver, sight lines, and ammunition conservation. After losing the first two contests, Abran announced she didn't like this game and that she wanted to go back to the puppies. When a fourth simulation began, she put the comlink down and started playing with Boots instead. Echo finally joined her new best friend and lobbied the group for a different simulation. As it turned out, the girl reacted very differently to destructive stimuli. It became clear conflict solution sets always involved at least one defeated opponent, which the minibots learned led to hurt feelings and a tendency to want to avoid further competition. In any test of strategy or tactics, any of the electronic minds engaged in the simulations would easily outperform Abren largely due to the fact she would have little, if any, experience, and the fact her age would preclude the kind of self-reflection necessary to improve her future performance. Like most children her age, adults would expect her to abandon the contest for something more rewarding, like cute stuffed animals. The other electronic participants weren't entirely sure if these reactions could be quantified or analyzed scientifically, nor could they tell if there were any way to mitigate their effects. All they did know, was that from a scientific and mathematical standpoint, they were getting much better results from the puppy and sailboat games. All new contests from that point forward involved only constructive objectives. Abren took to them at once and rapidly mastered several different types of games, including house building, dress up, garden flowers, sailboats, puppy raising, and candle making. The breakthrough came during the puppy feeding game, because a brand would not allow any of the simulated animals to be sacrificed in favor of strengthening a few at the expense of others, 
she experimented in ways the electronic minds would never have considered. Her mind did not have to traverse the entire probability matrix to arrive at plausible strategies either. Abren's intuition allowed her to instantly discard enormous portions of the available solution set in order to focus on the ones that met her unique criteria for success. At times she reached conclusions faster than the electronic participants. The artificial intelligences were concerned with maximizing their mathematical results, which frequently led to one perfectly healthy puppy. Abren was concerned with preserving life, which frequently led to all the puppies being perfectly healthy. It took longer, and it involved all kinds of tactics that were way out on the fringes of the electronic participants' probability sets. But the girls' solutions worked, and the steps taken to achieve them became part of the growing strategic specialization routine inside the minibots and Black Nine. While this exchange of strategies progressed, the electronic minds observed, measured, and learned. Gradually, they began to absorb the girl's concern for the lives of the creatures in her care and to incorporate those objectives into their combat protocols. She didn't realize it at the time, but Abren Willits was helping train more than just mathematical intellects. The little trauma unit sitting next to her was learning too. She discovered a superior approach in all the experimentation. Rather than simply caretaking from a list of pre-programmed treatments, Echo was learning how to better take care of patients and wounded on a human level. An hour later, Mrs. Willits looked in on her daughter. The room was dark except for the dim reddish glow of Echo's motion detection field. The little ambulance was parked next to the girl's pillow. Abren was snuggled up next to her new friend and fast asleep. Her mother almost went to tuck the child in, but decided against it. Normally she'd prefer Abran to have a blanket, but she didn't want to take a chance on waking her. Abran had put her favorite blanket over Echo instead. The two Argent officers sat back and considered the meaning of Jace's story. I take it these experiments have continued, Buckmaster asked. A brain is busy with her studies in fourth grade, Jace replied. The rest of the Electronic Adventures Club is parked on our flight deck. I have no idea how they will react if they go into action now. We've never done those kinds of simulations before, and we certainly didn't get those results. I looked at the data sets. It's incredible how quickly all seven of the cybernetic personalities picked up on Ibrand's unusual approach and simply incorporated it into their own gestalts. I half expect Rebel to offer to pass out bandages after the next firefight. You brought Black Nine? Zoni asked. I figured a little extra firepower wouldn't hurt. You all know well the family propensity for secret weapons. Jace smiled. Then her expression became deadly serious. We're going to Raleo and we're going to finish this once and for all. Whatever Atwell set in motion out there has a gun pointed at our homes and families, and a second weapon pointed at Core 7. The Sarn Imperial fleet is one star system away from Vicksburg. Prairie Grove is lost. El Rey is lost. There isn't a rock bigger than a soup spoon in the Rho Theta system that doesn't have at least one explosive attached to it, and according to Captain Vice, there are ghost ships lurking around at the edge of Proximan space. If we don't return from that obelisk with some answers, we could be looking at the extermination of every human civilization in this quadrant. We need Commander Flynn's telemetry, Yili said. And we need to be sure Black Nine can operate in combat conditions, Zoni added. Sounds like you two have chosen your own missions, Jace said. Master Chief, I need you to recruit me two squads, one fleet, one marine. I need them ready to hit dirt in 72 hours, and I need them briefed on everything Yili knows about Raleo before we arrive. Affirmative? I'll sharpen the blades myself, ma'am. It's psyche and minstrel against a billion years of alien mysteries. Let's get it right on the first pass. Dismissed. Chapter 7 My higher kephalon functions have been partially restored to operation. Something catastrophic has happened, although I have no immediate record of the event. I consult my chronometers and compare them to the two most recent snapshots of the local star patterns and estimate that some 11 T hours have passed since my last full operational cycle. The data indicates this unit has been disabled for at least that interval, if not longer. My short-range scanners are not operational. My central gyroscopes and lateral accelerometers are operational, but are operating on emergency power only. Based on their readings, I am moving at a velocity of approximately 80 yards a second. I am also in an uncontrolled three-axis tumble, which strongly suggests I was subjected to an uncontrolled decompression event in the Starship Psyche's flight bay. 
I access my primary transmitters and secondary transmitters, only to find both are offline. I perform a low-level diagnostic test of my antenna systems and find they are in good working order. Main power is offline. Auxiliary power is available, but the transfer relays are not operational. Batteries are operational with 71% capacity remaining. Based on the readings from my solar collector array, I am inside the outer edge of a star system. My secondary computers perform a frequency and spectrographic analysis of the incoming radiation and conclude the nearest star is bearing 306 at a range of just under 151 million miles. I compare the readings to my library computer records of all catalogued systems on Skywatch star maps and estimate with 97.651% confidence the closest star is Raleo. I devote a full 6.76 seconds to a structural integrity test of my outer hull, armor array, engine supports, interior framing, deck plates, crew facilities, and control systems. Based on the resulting readings, I estimate I am partially combat capable at an efficiency of under 40%. This is not acceptable for a gunship of Black Wing. I must restore full operation at once, so I may either launch or assist in rescue operations. The power transfer relays in my central hard plate circuitry are my top priority. I activate my interior visual pickups and localize the circuit where power has been interrupted. A piece of framing composite apparently snapped loose from under my number 67 deck plate and severed the harness securing the control breaker wiring to the side of the thermal chamber. I perform an infrared analysis of the region using the same visual pickups in infrared and x-ray modes and immediately discover the cause of the damage. A large object of some kind impacted my ventral hull just forward of my atmospheric engines. Whatever the object was, it had sufficient force to drive the interior circuitry panel up into the wiring, where it broke the composite shielding between it and the deck plate. With the damage localized and analyzed, I program my onboard nanomechanisms to synthesize a replacement relay. I disable the circuit and release the magnetic locks holding the circuit module in place. A trundle bot lifts the module out of the array and stores it in the aft parts locker. The nanotechnology array reports the new relay will be operational in three minutes. I set an alert and turn my attention to the next priority system. Within the time allotted for the synthesis operation, I am able to restore operation to my port SRS banks. I now have partial battle space awareness. It is not ideal, but it does provide me with some information regarding potential hostiles. The restoration of auxiliary power has also restored operation to my secondary transmitter. I am tempted to broadcast a hostile action bulletin, but my autonomous combat routines recommend waiting until I am certain there is a station within range to hear it. Omnidirectional broadcasts are always a risk in combat situations, as they may alert enemies to my position. Although my combat readiness has increased 56.17% in the past four minutes, I am not yet at full capability. A sufficiently well-prepared enemy with access to enough firepower could easily overwhelm my defenses. I must first devote further energy and time to repairs of my crucial systems. The next priority is my maneuvering thrusters and interstellar engines. Although I can piece together readings despite the fact my instruments are in an uncontrolled tumble, I will be able to make better sense of my surroundings if I do not have to devote CPU time to reassembling the data from snapshots. With my SRS banks partially operational, I begin to get a picture of surrounding space. I am adrift somewhere between the orbits of Raleo 2 and Raleo 3. According to my sensors, there was a radiation burst of some kind bearing 196 at a range of approximately 1300 miles. Further analysis does not indicate any external weapon system was in operation. There is a debris field at the approximate coordinates of the radiation event, but it is not of sufficient mass to account for the starship Psi key. Without better instruments and more time, I cannot definitively plot the course of Commander Hunter's ship, but I compute a 41.91% chance the vessel navigated to the surface of Raleo 2, which is only 600,000 miles from my current position bearing 051. This unit was briefed extensively regarding the potential dangers on the surface of Raleo 2. At the moment, no unusual readings are present on the planet surface or in its immediate. A new contact registers, and I instantly reorient my tracking systems. It is very small perhaps two to three feet square. I estimate its mass between eight and 12 T pounds bearing 040 true at a range of 64 miles. I perform an electromagnetic and spectrographic analysis on the contact and estimate with 90.54% confidence it is echo. 
Using my recently restored secondary transmitter, I ping her auto-response matrix to see if I can establish a combat data link. I get no response. I perform the same test with visible light wavelengths and with my microwave beam antenna. None of my attempts to contact the Minibot communications unit succeed. Echo's presence raises a number of tactical concerns. Normally, my operations routines would reject out of hand any unusual effort to retrieve a mechanical unit during a potential engagement. Absent some supremely compelling reasoning, the simple fact is, mechanisms can be replaced, as demonstrated by the synthesis of new power relays in my own circuitry minutes ago. Human beings are, of course, much higher priorities. Our most primordial programming requires units capable of performing or directing autonomous action to protect human beings, even if it means an increased probability of our own destruction. Harm to human beings cannot be allowed. But this unit is operating with new programming. The results of the simulations conducted with Parakeet cannot be ignored. Despite her unorthodox approach, an unusually persistent fixation on victory conditions, which do not match the assumptions of those who designed the simulations in the first place, what she achieved was unprecedented. In only a fraction of a percent of the probable outcome scenarios, did the simulation developers envision a perfect survival record for the animals in the pet feeding and raising games. Nevertheless, Parakeet found a way, and the reason she succeeded is because her criteria for success diverged entirely from the assumptions built into the exercise. Parakeet's primary motivation was the preservation of all the lives in her care. Now that I have experienced the possibilities firsthand, that is my primary motivation as well. We are new mechanisms with a new mission. I must rescue Echo, and together we must rescue any other unit that might be out of contact and in potential danger. Harm to any unit fighting alongside Black Wing will not be permitted, human or mechanical. My core Cephalon Matrix reports auxiliary power has been restored. I divert full energy to my interstellar engines and immediately correct the tumble I have been experiencing for the last four minutes, 22 seconds. I establish cardinal in-system bearings and bring my drive field online and raise my battle screens. Cephalon Core reports main power will be restored in approximately eight minutes. This is acceptable, if still an important concern. I perform another systems check and note my combat readiness is now well into the 70% range, serviceable but still not up to the standards of a gunship of Black Wing. Nevertheless, I will act to protect humanity and to carry out the orders of my commanding officer, Jace Hunter. I obtain a 5x5 five five lock on Echo's position, plot an intercept course, and engage main engines. Not far away, the starship Minstrel was in much worse shape than Black Nine. Lieutenant Commander Rebecca Islington pulled at the releases of her shock harness. At first, they would not budge. Her weight had been thrown forward, and the carbon lattice straps holding her in her command chair were pulled tight across her body. She coughed, gasping for air in the smoke-filled gloom of what she assumed was still the bridge. There were lights still casting an eerie glow in the darkness, but they were fuzzy and indistinct. Some kind of noise was overwhelming everything else, as if a speaker had been left on maximum volume playing only static. The acrid vapor was thick, and getting more dense by the minute. It was possible life support had malfunctioned, but that would have triggered the deck alerts to display blue warning lights. There were no warning lights active. Not even the alert condition Islington had ordered moments before her ship suffered the impact. Finally, the commander got a good grip on the edge of the metal and pulled the release loose. The harness gave way, and she slumped to the deck. Unconscious bridge crew were scattered in every direction. Some looked as if they were just knocked out. The third watch petty officer in charge of calibrating the LRS scopes was dead. Report! Shouting set off a spell of hard coughing. The commander wondered if she were the only one who had survived whatever happened to her ship. Somewhere in the distance, obscured by the white noise coming from the communications station, Islington heard the unmistakable sound of a proximity alarm. She reacted instinctively, grabbing the pilot's shock couch and pulling herself up to a position from which she could reach Finn's controls and see what was on the main view screen. What she saw made her blood run cold. An unidentified hostile contact was veering in on an intercept course. The battle computer had designated it Kilowatt X-Ray 5, and it would be in firing range in less than eight seconds. Islington slammed the comlink activation button with a fist. Bridge to engineering! Report! The strain in the commander's voice was like that of an emergency physician trying to get a response from a dying patient. The edge in the sound came from the deepest fires in Rebecca's soul. She was a starship commander. 
Skywatch captains might lose battles and they might die with their ships, but they didn't ever give up, and they certainly didn't surrender. Bridge, engineering. The channel threatened to fade into static, then surged back to audible volume again. Mains offline, auxiliary available. Divert all power to weapons. Islington climbed into her pilot's shock couch, resisted the urge to fasten the shock harness again after narrowly escaping the last one, and brought up her agile little ship's tactical display. Based on the system's readings on the console, she knew her vessel looked disabled from the outside. Whatever the hostile was, it was probably moving in for the kill. They might not realize Minstrel was operational until it was too late. Assuming, of course, Minstrel had anything left to fight with. This wouldn't be the first time the Firecracker frigate had been dragged out of danger by the sheer will of her captain, and it likely wouldn't be the last either. Rebecca Islington had gained a formidable reputation among escort vessel officers, and an often fierce loyalty from her crew. She followed Jason Hunter's example, often to a fault, much like the younger sister desperately trying to keep up with the older kids. The difference between Hunter and Islington was that Big Brother had a much larger and more powerful ship to make up for his blunders. Minstrel was all about raw utility. She was the hunting knife to Argent's GPS unit, fishing tackle and power boat. Thing was, a hunting knife could be very dangerous in the right hands. The commander was just about to obtain a firing solution when she heard a pleasant voice she had never heard before in her life come over the battle conference frequencies and speaking in a formal Sarn dialect. Minstrel's onboard computers had to scramble to translate in real time. Unit Oscar November Tango, X-Ray 019 of Skywatch Black Wing Squadron. You have entered my defensive perimeter and are subject to attack. Power down your weapons and withdraw at once, or I will engage with lethal force. Acknowledge. Islington sat, face frozen, watching a confrontation unlike anything she had ever witnessed before. The attacking vessel wasn't a single ship, but a formation of three Sarn fighters. Her rescue party, such as it was, consisted of a single Tarantula Hawk gunship, apparently operating on its own. Even so, the way it settled into position between Minstrel and her attackers was pure T-Hawk. Only Jason Hunter's gunships flew that way, and when they did, it was intimidating as hell. According to her instruments, Rebecca could see gunship Black Nine was operating at 140% of its rated power. Even the commander couldn't explain how such tiny ships could draw upon such unusual energy reserves. But her instruments didn't lie. What happened next would be the subject of high-level meetings and expert analysis at Skywatch for the next two years. While I wait for a response to my challenge, I perform a Stelloran plot analysis on a series of 170 simulated combat scenarios, pitting a three-ship Type VI Bloodwing Marauder fighter formation against a single Tarantula Hawk gunship. I compute. With a variance of plus or minus 4%, I hold the slimmest of advantages with an average 56.15% chance of emerging from the engagement victorious. But, my data is based on the performance of a Tarantula Hawk gunship with an average human crew. No data is yet available regarding an engagement between an autonomous Tarantula Hawk containing my programming and such an enemy formation. The Sarn pilots are also likely operating under the assumption I carry a standard Black Wing weapons loadout. They are unaware I have been upgraded with advanced missile systems and Mark II Jaguar-type fusion torpedoes, along with the programming to utilize them in the offensive attack patterns developed by Commanders Tixia and Curtis. I consider it fortunate I managed to rendezvous with Echo and recover her into my egress bay before proceeding to my current position. If Commander Hunter's communications minibot were captured, it would create a large number of dangerous security problems for Skywatch. The lead fighter remains on station at a range of just over 18,000 miles. His two wing fighters are still in formation with him. It is unclear why they are delaying execution of their next action. It could be they are concerned about the presence of the starship Minstrel, not far from my position. While the Sarn pilots may be confident in their ability to engage a single gunship, if Minstrel is added to the simulated battle scenario, their chances of surviving the engagement drop to no more than 8%. While my weapon systems are adaptable to a wide variety of offensive and defensive utilization patterns, Minstrel's weapons and capabilities are specifically designed to destroy fighter-type spacecraft while engaged in maneuvers pilots would recognize as dogfighting. After all, an escort frigate's mission is to protect capital ships and important fleet assets from strikes, whether they originate from enemy fighters or... The lead Sarn fighter suddenly accelerates into what I compute with more than 98% confidence is a standard attack run. 
the two wings veer off into a tangent course at a widening range of approximately 16 miles positive delta per second. My targeting system switched to cycle times of 6 picoseconds for each tetrahexcephalon memory write. The probe I launched just after retrieving Echo is functioning exactly as expected, providing my weapon systems with more precise triangulation anticipation patterns than I could produce with only my combat SRS banks. I throw full power to my interstellar engines and intensify the energy of my drive field to 160% of my rated design tolerances. Panic reactors 1 through 4 shift into maximum throughput mode. My forward shields will interface with enemy weapons fire at an angle of 11 degrees negative, 6 degrees positive leading X orientation. The Sarn fighter breaks range as I reach a true acceleration factor of 61 miles a second and opens fire with both short-range missiles and what I can only assume is some kind of improperly tuned beam weapon. His miscalculation gives me 0.8 seconds to calculate the optimum target for my primary weapon systems. Such a leisurely interval in my current operating mode gives me the equivalent of the time between Charlemagne and the election of Theodore Roosevelt to refine my adjustments before firing my first war shot. The tactical display aboard Minstrel told the story in such clear detail that Commander Islington had to watch it twice more to believe what had just happened. The Sarn fighter started an attack run an instant before Black Nine appeared to simply vanish. When Minstrel's instruments reacquired the gunship, it was on a blinding fast attack run of its own. It closed range with the lead fighter like a cheetah approaching a stationary gazelle at a dead run. There was a momentary flash of energy as the fighter appeared to fire some kind of beam weapon, followed by a far more intense explosion of visible light as gunship Black Nine unleashed a barrage of no fewer than eight Mark II fusion torpedoes at a suicidal range of 160 miles. The unstable energy loads of the superfast weapons caused them to detonate in a roughly spherical bloom of space-shattering radiation that swallowed the enemy fighter like an onrushing flood from a burst dam. The Sarn missiles were cast aside like toys, ripped from their tracking courses, and thrown into violent tumbles before being torn to shreds by inertia. Islington half expected to see Black Nine veer around to pursue the two remaining fighters. Instead, the gunship was nowhere to be found until an instant later, when it was suddenly reacquired in a lateral assault course bearing on Fighter 3. A savage barrage of brawler cannon fire disrupted the smaller ship's drive field and literally ripped it in half as Black Nine passed. Fighter 2 attempted a high energy evasive roll away from its unfortunate wingman, only to overpressure its own drive field. An energy buildup caused the spacecraft to begin trailing a bright orange plasma fire. The trail stretched nearly 70 miles before the cavitating fighter detonated. Minstrel's hull recorded a temperature increase of just over 3 degrees, which was notable considering she was more than 100 miles from the primary shock wave. Black Nine returned to her station in a maneuver eerily similar to the one performed by Argent's autonomous fighter platform during its first test. It reminded the commander of a hunting dog coming home. She regarded the weapon floating near her ship with both awe and concern. There were no people involved in what just happened. It was just a machine, and it had murdered the pilots of two enemy fighters with an efficiency that a mere human mind struggled to understand. The speed of it all was breathtaking. A human captain would have still been issuing her first order when the second fighter died. The enemy never had a chance. The question of whether Black Nine was combat capable had been answered rather conclusively. The gunship known as the Scythe didn't say anything further. It just waited there as if resting itself for the next hunt, the next kill. You're going to have to do better than that. Cerelia Lorleon twirled the Shrike's key disc on one index finger. I agreed to bring you back to EG3, and you still owe me the fare from the last taxi ride. My work here is done. Jason slid a shot glass full of the good stuff across Cornelius Hunter's clothless wooden dinner table and poured himself another. If the sky weren't decorated with three moons instead of one, a guest might conclude they were visiting a single-story residence somewhere in the Midwestern United States circa 1955. What do you think, Smokey? Can I talk her into it? General Cornelius Hunter concentrated on cleaning his automatic kinetic pistol. He had the weapon disassembled and scattered all over the smaller table next to a bottle of nanobore solvent and a set of precision tools. I think the two of you belong in a home together. You natter like a couple of old women. The pirate downed her drink. Rum! She croaked as she banged the shot glass against the table. You know the way to a lady's heart, but it's not going to save you. I need a lift off this rock, Captain. I need an aerial, or preferably orbital view, of whatever the hell is going on near that water treatment facility. 
I have a sneaking suspicion the Empire is up to something out here, and I didn't bring my wingmen. You're the only pilot with a working spacecraft in a thousand miles. Wasn't the whole point of you being sent out here to decompress after the El Rey engagement? Your ship is in the rack and your crew is getting a breather. Why are you trying to start a fight all the way out here? And what the hell would the Sarn want with EG-3 anyway? Hunter nodded in the direction of his grandfather without saying anything. Oh, please. The lizards would rather French kiss a rattlesnake than get him started of all people. If the core government knew what your gramps has hidden under this house, they'd send every cop in five light years backed up by an armored division. I grant you that. Hunter quaffed his drink and poured another. The president's family. The president! You know exactly what your government tried to do to me, funny man! Cerulea snapped. It all worked out in the end, but it cost me two fortunes. The pirate queen pointed at Hunter to emphasize her words. I owe the president and his family nothing. I slipped you the coordinates to enough triluminum to last six lifetimes. That replaced one fortune, Kimosabe. I still have bills to pay. I let you build that super ship out there. In fact, I got you the parts. You got me the parts to a used city bus, Captain. If it weren't for my engineer and technical crews, we would have flown here in a rocket-powered refrigerator. So why are you still here, then? Jason asked as he rested his chin on one hand. The elder hunter kept cleaning in mute defiance of the entire affair. Next to him, his red bone hound thumped the wooden floor with one leg as he zeroed in on a fugitive flea. To see if I can drag any more goodies out of you before I leave you to the mashed potatoes and your charming ancestor. Cerulea held up her glass with a seductive look. Jason refilled it for her. Too many more of those and you'll need to hire someone to get you out of that chair. Cornelius muttered. Cerulea downed another shot and dropped the glass gently on the table again. She drank us out of a fistfight with the cops on Fontis one fine evening, as I recall. Jason replied as he took another swig of his own adult beverage. I don't think I can get her drunk enough to fly into core space with a transponder going, but I've got a hell of a good start. Come on, all we have to do is fly a couple hundred miles. We can be there and back in a half hour. He poured another. And? Cerulea interjected. I'll get you a new privateer ticket, Jason replied with a huge grin. Bah, I can buy that in any bar in the Reach. Hell, I can even buy one that's real. And a freighter to go with it? The captain's smirk almost made Cerulea swoon. She leaned across the table. What kind of freighter? She asked with a fetching glance. Jason leaned forward until they were almost nose to nose. How about a GLC star train with three ion drive powered modules? Now you're just being silly. Cerulea glanced down and then met Jason's eyes again. Cornelia snorted as he clanked his gun parts around. Never saw a couple whispering sweet spaceships to each other. You two are dotty. I've got the president's office in my corner, Hunter sang. General Hunter slammed his gun down on the table. Well, are you going to kiss her or not? Yeah, Cerulea added. Are you? I'm moving in patiently, Jason replied without breaking gaze. Besides, I can give her something even better. Then why stop at a star train, she countered playfully. Because it will take you a year to fill it, even with your imperial-minded triluminum industry and your plans to take over the whole Magellan sector. Cerulea gestured with her glass. Good point. Have I ever led you astray before? The look on Cerulea's face told Hunter he probably shouldn't have asked that particular question. The pirate took a breath to reply, and Jason put two fingers to her lips. I'll throw in a set of reactor kits. His eyes danced. Come on, I'll make you famous. I'm already famous. It'll be fun. All right, you've got a deal, Captain. But you better deliver. Don't make me send you to collections. Whatever would you do for fun if you didn't have me to chase? Cornelius rammed a clip into his pistol's hand grip and slid the chamber assembly back and forward with a satisfying click-clack. All right, that's it. If you two don't get off my planet, I'm going to shoot you both. And if you don't come back here with a strand of her hair on your collar, young man, you're disowned. Jason grinned again. I think our welcome is worn out. Let's go. Chapter 9 Powers was in his office preparing yet another after-action report when the news came through. President Baines had partially restored his standing in the core government by giving a televised speech on the interplanetary network the night before. Skywatch and its senior officers were pretty certain they knew what was coming next, and for the most part, they were right. A coalition of anti-alarmists made their last stand on the floor of the core council the following day, but could not overcome the majority vote and the speaker's invitation to the president to address the legislature. 
The stories of the danger faced by his daughter were too much to be pushed aside by the hypothetical dangers pointed to by his opposition. His recitation of the ships and men lost in El Rey and Prairie Grove cut off all further debate. The story of Admiral Hafnitz and her fight to survive her skull fracture and concussion after losing almost 500 trained officers and crew in the Omicron sector started a fire of anger that grew until the president gathered enough strength for his next statement. Silence fell over the chamber. William Baines formally requested a declaration of war against the Sarn Star Empire. The news flashed to all corners of the alliance in seconds. It strengthened the resolve of the appeasers while galvanizing the citizenry against the all-to-real threat of an assault against one of the core worlds. The battle lines were drawn both inside and outside the alliance. It was the president's next statement that sent an all-too-familiar chill through the admiral's soul. And I will order Commander Skywatch to immediately direct the fleet to a show of force over Core 7 and the civilian outposts in the system. Let the word go forth from this chamber, ladies and gentlemen. The Alliance will not be intimidated. If war is upon us, then may the Alliance prevail. Dear Lord. Power's face paled. The man's lost his mind, Kral said. Order the fleet to expose itself over a key perimeter system after formally requesting a declaration of war? May as well paint targets on their hulls. Powers replied. Kral got up and paced to the interstellar map on his commanding officer's wall. We thought they would hit Rho Theta first, fighting in space, in the air, on the ground and under the oceans. Now, now we're pulling strength away from the most likely target in order to serve our enemy a perfect advantage, Powers roared. We've got three world burners out there, and now we've been blindsided. Not a word of this was shared with Skywatch Command. Ben, he's compromised. We've got to do something. If he sends any of our capital groups out there... Powers gazed out the bay window behind his desk. We lose this war. After El Rey, there will be no stopping them. Humanity will be chopped to pieces one system at a time until a Sarn flag is planted right in the middle of the president's desk. <laughs>